good morning and very warm welcome to the consultative meeting on collaborative strategies for managing aquatic biological invasions as a part of one week one lab program to begin with today's meeting i request the following people to kindly join us on the dais first i request dr rajat kumar ias special secretary of government of telangana irrigation and environment science and technology chairman telangana biodiversity board to join us on the dais Next, I request Dr. Vinay Kumar Nandikuri, Director, CSIR CCMB, to join us on the dais. Yes. I request Dr. N. Narasimha Murthy, ARS Chief Executive IC of National Fisheries Development Board, Government of India, to please join us on the dais. Yes. On the dais. Okay. Uh, we have another guest, uh, Shri uh, Lakshmi Ram Bokhia, IR SME Commissioner of Fisheries. He'll be joining us in a in a some in some time. I also request Jaya to welcome Shri Kalicharan S. Kartade, IES Member Secretary, Telangana Biodiversity Board. We shall now begin the program with the welcome address and uh, discussing about the objectives of the meeting by Dr. Umapati from CSIR CCMB. Good morning, a warm welcome to respected Dr. Rajat Kumar, IAS, Special Chief Secretary to the Government of Tamil, uh, Telangana, Irrigation, Environment and Science Technology, also a Chairman, Telangana Biodiversity Board, Dr. Vinay Kumar Nandukuri, Director, CSR CCMB, Hyderabad, respected Dr. Narsimha Murthy, Chief Executive Officer in charge, National Fisheries Development Board, Government of India, respected College Saran, IAS, Member Secretary, Telangana Biodiversity Board, respected Lachiram Bukhya, Commissioner of Fisheries, Telangana is on the way, and invited colleagues from Dehradun to Trivandaburam, ladies and gentlemen, estimated participants, including media personalities and honored guests. A warm and cordial welcome to each one of you to this significant consultative meeting on university species. Today, we gather here with a shared sense of response, responsibility and a collective commitment to address one of the most pressing challenges in our time, that the threat posed by invasive species to our environment, biodiversity and economies. This meeting has been organized as part of CSAR One Week, One Lab program to disseminate knowledge, engage with the public, to make aware of updated knowledge in various subjects including biodiversity conservation. Allow me to express my gratitude to all of, all of you sparing your valuable time to join us in this important discourse. Your presence here highlights the gravity of issue at hand and reaffirms our dedication <coughs> to the finding sustainable solutions. As we commence this consultative meeting, let us take a moment to reflect on the impact that the species had on our ecosystem and delicate balance of the nature. This non-native non species often introduced unintentionally intentionally have proven to be formidable adversaries to the, our native flora and fauna. Their aggressive proliferation disturbed habitats, threatened biodiversity and pose a significant risk to agriculture, forestry, fisheries and even public health. The consequence of native consequence of invasive species are not confined to specific region, they transcend geographical boundaries necessitate a united collaborative approach. It is only through collective action, shared knowledge, a robust co cooperation that we can effectively address global challenge. During our time together, we will engage a thoughtful discussion, exchange experiences and deliberate best practices. 
innovative methodologies and latest research findings. We must leverage our combined expertise, diverse perspective to formulate comprehensive strategies that can mitigate the impact of industry species, pave the way for more resilient and sustainable future. This is not first such a national meeting held, but there are few meetings already happened and discussed impact of industry species as a whole. Here we will focus only aquatic industry species. It is directly affects rural economy in changing climate scenario on the extermination of local endemic fish species. Because of our recent studies in our, on our two industry fish, namely African sharp tooth catfish, American armored catfish showed al alarming findings that our African catfish was found almost 95 percent of all our water bodies, while armored catfish found to be almost 60 percent of all water bodies which is examined. In fact, African catfish even gone into pristine river ecosystem, both Western Ghats and Eastern Ghats. I am confident that through the open dialogue, active engagement, a shared vision, we can forge a, a path that leads us, leads us a world where industries are no longer impossible challenge. Instead, we, all, we will build a world where the resilience of our ecosystem is safeguarded and treasures of biodiversity are cherished and preserved. Once again, thank you all for being part of this consultative meeting. Let us unite our efforts, draw inspiration from one another and work hand in hand to create a sustainable future free from shed of invasive species. Thank you so much. I welcome you once again, all of you. Now we welcome Dr. Vinayakin Nandakuri to deliver director's address. For uh, last one week, we have been doing various activities related to CSIR CCMB. Today, it's my pleasure to invite Sri Lachiram Bukherji, Narasim uh, uh, Murthy who has not yet come, and uh, uh, yes, yes, the other one hasn't come, sorry. Um, Dr. Rajat Kumar, IAS, Special Secretary to Government of Telangana, Irrigation and Environment, Science and Technology, and Chairman Telangana Biodiversity Board. So CCMB is an institute that was originally started way back in 77, and the campus that we all know out there, next to Habsigoda Station, opened in 1987. At that point of time, Lacons was not existent, nor are any other campuses of CCMB. We used to, original idea of what which, with which CCMB was founded is to do modern science in, you know, at a highest possible level and find its applications. A terrific example of that was our founder director himself, Pushpa Bhargava, who used to be like well-known molecular biologist of India at that time and he used to, he had at some point of time back-to-back -back papers in a public, in a journal called Nature which is by far the best possible journal that there is in science. And in, as the time progressed, he recruited uh, many scientists, one of them is Dr. Lalji Singh. Dr. Lalji Singh worked on many aspects including genomics and he looked at the population migration of the people, how people have moved from Africa to India, what is the earliest population that entered India and he showed many things and basically he kind of disproved the Arden invasion theory. And Dr. Lalji Singh actually started this DNA fingerprinting as part of a basic research and ultimately we were one of the the first three countries in the world to come up with our own probes for DNA fingerprinting. And that is how many problems of criminal issues have been solved around that time in early 90s. And it went on to become an institute by itself. 
which deals with uh, even today deals with these aspects called C Center for DNA Fingerprinting Institute. So La Dr. Lalji Singh was in, in fact the founder of that. And the other thing is during those years there was this particular challenge of you know you go to like sometimes uh, samples of wildlife uh, samples are caught at airports or wildlife animals and some other things are uh, been transported illegally what to do about it whether we have the technology or not he was approached and that's how lacones got initiated and ultimately lacones became an institute here in this place and it is completely his vision that led to what we see today and the beauty of this particular building lacon ccmb is that it is built into the existing landscape okay so it's not it does not the, the way it's been built it does not disturb the landscape all the rocks are retained this is one of the most beautiful buildings that i've seen only other thing that i remember very similar to this is actually in where i had uh, i was previously called national institute of immunology in that place also it was built into the uh, uh, landscape in jnu and you can see very very similar kind of structures if you ever go to nii but the thing is lacons when it was conceptualized why it was focusing on wildlife diagnostics as the time progressed we have had recruitments uh, and many scientists joining including uh, i mean all these people like uh, uh, karte kumapati and all these people started working on various areas and we have two young scientists uh, uh, megna and janvi so with we have around now total seven people working in this particular campus working in varied things one of the focuses and continues to remain is wildlife diagnostics another focus is to keep the store the embryos and uh, uh, keep the that and so that we can actually look into reviving endangered species and umapati has varied areas of research which including looking at silka lake micro biodiversity all the way to um, you know he looks at all these lakes and he's just now talked about fish and uh, how uh, african uh, catfish is become a problem for our indian uh, fish farmers or in general i believe the taste is not good that's what they were told i don't eat fish so i didn't know and <coughs> kartikeyan's research is on uh, snakes and snake venoms and uh, even otherwise he's also involved in the most recent research which i find it quite interesting is a problem on uh, shawls so uh, if you or uh, if anybody knows it's uh, pashmina shawls are considered uh, uh, kashmina shawls as it is mentioned in certain parts of the world are considered um, um, like you know high end shawls which are supposed to be uh, one expensive and you know wearing something like this uh, can you keep it quiet um, something like that uh, it can you um, yeah so so problem with pashmina shawls which are expensive and well known is sometimes other set of shawls called uh, coming from antelopes which are endangered species come into play called chatush so, uh, so this particular uh, this particular problem is a bigger one because it is coming from endangered species and sometimes they get stuck at lacones kashmiri traders in fact ladakh governor had visited and asked if ccmb can actually participate in this project and it was uh, taken up and hopefully in about next 6 months we will have a reasonably good solution and proper dna marker that will uh, segregate or separate pashmina or one one can identify whether it is coming from shatu shar from uh, from pashmina so this this thing is work in progress i find it fascinating and uh, there are other things she uh, we have megna here works on uh, our plant conservation issues and we have um, janvi working on um, um, you know ca uh, caterpillars and uh, how their venom works and various various other aspects related to it but point is um, it is unique in csir there are 37 institutes 
and none not one institute other than this has something similar to this so we are very unique which also is, is a advantage and creates a problem and in fact our director general CSIR who's opened uh, the one week one lab when she came here we were talking about how to get students how to get them funded because it falls between the stools so these are the kind of things that uh, uh, that we are working on from the context of uh, CSIR and uh, I am very proud of the work done by Lacons and I was just telling Karthik that it is my job to make sure that the work is presented properly to wider audience and I need to start working towards that as the time progresses um, and, the, and I'm very happy to note the presence of um, such uh, honorable guest on our dais and I really hope I'm hoping to listen to you and uh, there will be some interesting discussions on the biodiversity which will be great to follow at a later point of time and with this and you know let me since I'm anyway here let me thank all the people since it is the last day who have participated in one week one lab program and you know it, it can be Sundatta to Lakshmi to all the other people who are involved in this I mean faculty students we had a lot of students involved in various aspects of one week one lab and we had every day for information of you that we at a minimum we were hoping to get 300 school students on a daily basis so that they get to see what kind of research we do and yesterday it completely went out of hand in a positive way we had 1500 students school kids who came to our campus there and we have actually organized stalls for every aspect of biology that we do and you know it, they were very crowded we had live experiments there for the students and I'm really really uh, thrilled with the way students and faculty and uh, all the support staff of uh, CCMB have participated in this particular one week one lab and made it a huge success today is the concluding part of it and I'm looking forward to a super good closure to the one week one lab program that we have had and thank you all for uh, being here and thank you so for coming and we look forward to listening to you Thank you, Dr. Vinay Kumar Nandikuri, for uh, uh, telling us about the kind of research which Lakhons does in uh, wildlife conservation and ecological sciences. I request Dr. Umapati to kindly uh, felicitate uh, Dr. Vinay Kumar Nandikuri. Now I request, uh, now I welcome Dr. L. Narsiva Murthy, our guest of honor, to address the gathering. Thank you. Uh, respected guests at the dais, of the dais, invitees, friends, students. Uh, I think uh, CCMB directors told about his organization. Yes, so I have to start with my organization. So I am from uh, this iconic uh, fish building called uh, National Fishes Development Board. Yeah, it's a recognition in uh, Hyderabad. If somebody missed the address, you just tell, uh, I mean, especially this airport road and all this thing. Machli building like a So any drivers will understand. Yes, I am, yes, Ponchgaya Airport. <laughs> okay, uh, that's the thing. So I was uh, working as a senior executive director. Uh, recently, I, I mean, uh, as additional charge, um, now uh, taken over as chief executive also. Basically, I'm a scientist from ICR and uh, uh, Indian Council of Agriculture uh, under uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Farmer Welfare. Just uh, one and a half year back, I deputed for this National Fisheries Development Board. So, pure professional. I studied in Mangalore. Seven years I worked in Gujarat, five years in Andhra Pradesh, eight years in Maharashtra. Extensively traveled uh, uh, India and few other countries also. So, at the outset, I would like to congratulate uh, CCMB director and his team uh, for this uh, today's uh, discussion. Uh, this is very, very important. In fact, uh, from last uh, one year, I was uh, searching for this type of opportunity. Who will uh, I mean, uh, give the details about this invasive species. 
because uh, you know uh, national fisheries development board all over india we are getting grievances so every state every uh, i mean reservoirs every open waters so in fact under uh, pradhan mantri mat sampada yojana a flagship program of honorable prime ministers we have 20050 crores so it's a huge uh, fund from last uh, five years we are working on that so from independence actually allotted uh, amount for the fisheries is close to around 4 to 5000 crores but from 2019 20 onwards next five years 20 to 25 this honorable prime minister allotted uh, is on 20000 crores so we are uh, i mean verge of completion by 2025 march we need to complete and uh, i mean we have to achieve the target like 1 lakh crore as foreign exchange 220 lakh ton as production then employment generation per capita consumption achieving nutrition security there are many target is given of course almost like uh, uh, 65 to 70% we achieved things are going very smoothly but uh, in between yes there are uh, issues when it comes to uh, climate change when it comes to uh, sustainability when it comes to uh, i mean new new people who are all coming into the field to make this aquaculture is uh, industry or sustainable or livelihood thing so these are some of the species really troubling them so initially uh, i mean uh, like um, green revolution in india what is up and then uh, white revolution then blue revolution is started so just to i mean make production and all those things yes uh, some decisions we have taken uh, we had our own species like imc like katla rohom rudal then uh, in addition to that exotic cost came in then we bought uh, tilapia okay so almost one decade the tilapia was there then later it is legally approved then it was nile tilapia nile was there then mosambicus was there you know i think uh, many fisheries experts are here i've just gone through that uh, overall going to speak for next uh, uh, i mean another three four hours um, so it's a prolific breeder it is very difficult to control that okay it's in addition to that we got this garipinus then uh, then the people are uh, i mean uh, i mean by uh, prestige or something actually the people are using this ornamental fishes and all those things without understanding the what are the species to be i mean maintained and all those things suddenly when they feel bad or they're unable to control and all those things straight away they all go dump into that uh, reservoirs open waters so where the sucker fish menac has started so i have seen some of the reports recently bangalore one two three tanks they reported so i mean this really issue uh, so if it is enters in the open waters in other part of the water body is so it will be a definitely a, i mean serious issue so one is garipinus i think uh, already uh, dr umapati has highlighted that it is not is always a culture thing the food they are using for that fish that's again is a matter whatever that uh, slaughter waste is coming chicken waste is coming so simply they are coming and dumping onto that sir. so it's a i mean very carnivorous thing if you just put your hand it will cut so it will eat everything then naturally it may grow 1 kilo 2 kilo 3 kilo maybe uh, i mean farmer may be very happy but after that what will happen that water body we have to discharge that water body so there are uh, pet animals cows and all other things there are many reports uh, i mean this all our domestic animals are died by drinking that water and all those things i think somewhere we have to draw a line uh, somewhere uh, we have to make a I mean, very strong recommendation for this type of things you have mentioned uh, i mean some percentage was also is cultured in india but most of the states is banned but still uh, yeah illegal uh, culture is going on by considering all these things uh, when dr umapati came to me uh, for this uh, i mean inviting for this function so maine bola main to sunne ke liye aata hu i know <laughs> because i want to know more about this uh, thing so i am happy that uh, a few experts from kerala few experts from other part of india are there i am sure they are going to give very clear picture about uh, this species not only uh, the species and how they are doing and all those things then how to draw a conclusion so some policy issues since our is a development agency so we need to know i mean uh, what are the things i mean in that so that we can take to the next higher level to stop this type of thing because utilization of open bodies is very very important for us vertical expansion of fish culture is very important because we are not in a i mean uh, position where we can lose the land whatever we have so if you can see haryana punjab rajasthan and all those things, once upon a time it was actually helped us to um, get the food like uh, when it comes to green revolution but now i think 
and almost like 30 to 40 percent uh, we are getting as a saline waters 6 ppt 7 ppt 8 ppt up to 12 ppt water uh, i mean water saline water we're getting so all these are converting as a fish culture or stream culture even sangli area some part of karnataka all the sugarcane belt is converting as a lacquer in waters so by considering all these things again the new area new thing new uh, i mean land is converting for the fish so it may not be correct at percent because we are losing land if we take from 1947 to till date so for that vertical expansion open water utilization government of india approved whatever the reservoirs we have one percent of the water body can be utilized for cage culture so uh, our uh, secretary of is here um, for water resources definitely will have some points on that so when we utilize this type of thing this type of species comes in between and uh, i mean creating the nuisance definitely is a concern for any farmer okay because now fisheries is not just a, a science or something it's a industry now so in india if you take today as and date we are getting almost like 68000 crores as a foreign exchange okay that is a one sector in the covid which is uniformly shown the growth this is niti ayog report i am not telling this so mr ramesh and the niti ayog uh, member is uh, i mean uh, openly gave the press statement so even in covid it, we gave the good results and a uh, lot of investment has been done then maybe another 3 4 years we may get uh, very good results so uh, nutrition security is a one thing so river ranching is a one process government of india has taken up now when it comes to river ranching is a open waters so this type of species definitely it will create the nuisance for the native species conservation part we are working very hard especially northeastern part himalayan parts and all those things so i request all of you who are going to speak and request uh, ccmb to make a i mean uh, recommend a proper and uh, i mean very uh, best uh, uh, what are called uh, recommendations or a uh, policy for, uh, to take it into the next level at the higher level of the policy matter. So with uh, with this, uh, once again, thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, CCMB and his team uh, for inviting me for this just uh, uh, brief few things, whatever the government of India initiatives and the NFDB initiative. Definitely NFDB will be always with all the organizations, uh, our uh, biodiversity uh, member secretary, Mr. Uh, Kalicharan is here. So so definitely we were all we can all all work with that so research part you can take care uh, i mean uh, and beneficial identification identification of the area you can take our uh, uh, water resources uh, secretary sir can help us uh, to understand the water resources of uh, telangana by i mean by hand holding each and everybody definitely we can come out with the results so with this i'll conclude once again thank you very much so i'm happy to listen to all of you thank you Thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, L. Narasimha Murthy, for the talk, for the insightful talk. And I request Dr. Vinay Kumar Nandikuri to please felicitate our guest of honor. Now we welcome uh, Dr. Rajat Kumar, our chief guest of the day, for addressing the gathering. Dr. Nandakuri, Dr. Narasimha Murthy, distinguished participants in today's discussions, very good morning to all of you. Dr. Narasimha Murthy was saying that I am coming to listen to you, I am coming to listen to you, but unfortunately, I am also coming to listen to you. So, first of all, I would like to actually applaud CCMB for their initiative. This one lab, one week program, it's a great thing. You know, I mean, one of the things that I personally believe in is that though we have come a long way since our independence in 1947, there's still a lot to be done to inculcate the scientific spirit, the scientific temper that our founding fathers of the Constitution talked about. I 
amongst the portfolios that I hold as the Special Chief Secretary of the state. One of them is science technology, science and technology. And I have always felt that we do very little towards that. It's all always some project based. You know, you get some funding, either the DST or DBT gives us some funding and we want to quickly construct a building, start another center. That's not what real inculcation of scientific temper is all about. I think I congratulate you on handling 1,500, you know, hot and fervid students who came to see that. And I hope they had a great experience. I'm telling you because small things in a child's mind can trigger off. You know, we have a population of 140 billion and I'm sure we are deserving of many more Nobel Prizes and many more accomplishments than what we have achieved till date. It's always, I feel, it's always a kind of a J curve that, uh, you know, you start small and uh, it, it kind of gathers moss as it rolls along and all that and before you know a center of culture, a culture of excellence builds around that. So, small beginning sir, but I think that uh, it's a beginning nevertheless and the numbers are very promising. I do hope that in your tenure as the director here, you would continue these initiatives. We have actually another called Open Day on 26th September that is attended by almost 7,000 schools. Wonderful. And we should try and make it systemic. So we should not have one-off. I mean, I am a great uh, opponent of these projects and one-off days and celebrations. It should be in our DNA now. CCM is the right time and place to talk about bringing it into our DNA. So uh, uh, we need to get these things worked out very, very carefully. and. I, in my capacity of uh, the uh, Secretary of Science and Technology, would look forward to, you know, Hyderabad actually is a wonderful place for these kind of uh, steps. Uh, we have many centers of excellence. I do not know by what quirk of fate they all came to be here. But I believe that Hyderabad, after Delhi, of course, Delhi gets as a national, this thing has a pride of place in research institutions and centers of excellence. But Hyderabad is not lagging very far behind. At one time I was working on uh, what we were called, what we call and still call, it's gone off to other people now. When I was Secretary of Industries Department, we were working on that. So we call the Research and Innovation Circle of Hyderabad. And there were about 100 odd institutions of national, international level. Many more are being added also. I mean, when we were writing at that time, the IIT Hyderabad was in its nascent stages. I think it had just been sanctioned. It was operating out of some. So all said and done, uh, anyway, I mean, uh, don't want to confine my talk only about the scientific temper thing, but I think that's a very big thing. And uh, I definitely would like to support you in whatever you want to do. Uh, we can think of certain like long lasting engagements. Maybe, you know, uh, some of our brighter students can come get more like exposure in another center of excellence like Lacons is doing great job. You've been participating with our government and you've been doing a good job there. So we would like more interaction and more sort of <coughs> systemic interaction rather than one-off like, you know, events and things like that. Now coming to this uh, issue of uh, aquatic uh, biological invasions. See, uh, biological invasions are nothing new to the earth as such, even to mankind. And human beings are the most invasive species. You know, they, they, if you, those of you who are students of history would have, we have literally wiped out like, you know, I mean, the populations of so many species. Harari talks about uh, around 45,000 years back, people crossed over from Java into Australia. And within 1,000 years, all the animals which were 5 to 25 kg in size were wiped out from Australia. So, uh, we, we are predators, we are the greatest contributors and even if in a small way we are talking about a small conclave, we are talking about managing biological invasions, I think it's at least a start. 
So, I, I mean, another anecdote, you know, this, uh, the Spaniards, like 1492, Columbus went to Americas. Do you know how many people kill, were killed because of the diseases that they brought? I mean, about one million. In those days, the world had a very small population, so the new world was completely wiped out. Not, you know, there is a very nice book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, and uh, by Jared Diamond, a Pulitzer Prize winning guy. So, uh, it's very interesting, you know, more people were killed because of the diseases that they brought forth. Two of the big uh, civilizations of that time, the Aztecs and the Mans, uh, were wiped to some report that had landed on my table, I've seen. Uh, about 127 billion dollars is what was the cost estimated of uh, the economic cost of uh, invasive, invasive species in India. And if I remember that report correctly, there are like some 2,700 odd species in India out of which 330 are classified as invasive species. And only 10 were studied for the economic impact and that then gave a figure of 127 billion dollars. 127 billion dollars is a figure that should make us think. And that's also, there is a lot of knowledge gap there. There is no clear understanding of what are the dimensions of the uh, invasion and damages that these species are bringing forth. Just one species, a semi-aquatic species at that, uh, the yellow fever mosquito has contributed quite significantly. I mean, according to that report, uh, the aquatic and semi-aquatic invasive species have caused more havoc than the terrestrial invasive species. So, uh, there are a number of challenges. First challenge is to, I always feel, I always feel, the other day also I was speaking at some forum, about uh, the challenges of climate change and all. And I think the biggest challenge here is that our science is not keeping pace with the way the problems are arising. We need more concerted scientific action to come up with viable solution to these problems. The first and foremost challenge is there. I mean, I have a basic degree in engineering, so uh, I feel that science has an answer to a lot of problems that mankind is facing today. And CCMB sir, is one of the institutes that we look forward to bringing solutions here. So that's something again, you know, I mean, uh, the CEO of NFTB was mentioning about, I have the charge of water resources in the state. Uh, that's another area which has grown tremendously in Telangana. You know, I mean, we have now in the Godavari Basin about 147 TMC storage capacity created since the formation of the state. 147 TMC, can you visualize it in your mind? No, not easy. Of course, probably the full form of TMC must be known to you. 1000 million cubic feet. The funny way they don't call it a trillion, it's 1000 million. Okay. So, uh, just to give you an idea, you have seen the tank bond, right? Now that's 0.8 TMC. So 200 tank bonds have been created, that's the expansion of water bodies in the state, since the formation of the state. Apart from that, many of the old tanks have been revived under Mission Kakatiya. And uh, we have done uh, what I personally feel in my 30-35 years of uh, career as an IS officer one of the most significant works that I've seen being done by a government. And I don't speak as the secretary of the department for that, my association only three years long. But I speak as an Indian citizen. I think like, I mean, as an Indian, we can be proud of what we have accomplished in Telangana in the last decade or so. This, this project itself, the Kaleshwaran project, it's a huge project which lifts Godavari waters about half a kilometer up five Hussein Sagars, three TMC, are lifted half a kilometer up and sent down 120 kilometers to the highest point that's near Hyderabad called Konda Pochamma. So that's at 618 meters and uh, from a height of about 45, 50 meters we, we raised that. And uh, it was done in a span of three years. Now this is unparalleled. I mean, this is unparalleled in India. 
and this is fairly unusual. I mean, this speed of execution, the Chinese have done some very significant projects, but even their three gorges and all took a longer time than this. Somehow they had less challenges, I believe, because they weren't faced with the Indian judiciary, which is something that those of you who have dealt with will realize. We say that we have to go to the house, so we have to go to the house, and we have to go to like, you know, I mean, uh, the judiciary. So in spite of those challenges in those kind of working environments, this has been created, and this gives us a great opportunity to partner also with LACONS, with CCMB at large, uh, we look at, like, I mean, since the topic for the day is, you know, aquatic invasive species, we would like to have, like, you know, some kind of a project we can co-work together. And uh, this could be a very, very uh, sort of, uh, because we can support you here, you have a larger, tiny, you know, like, laboratory to work on, so to say. And uh, this could be a very, very, like, insightful paper, useful paper for Indian government at large. Incidentally, like Aapke Secretary Sahib or Bachmati, I know Abhilakshis are very interested. Abhilakshis is one of those most interested. We can rope him in. So, uh, so these kind of things we would look forward to. And, 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 and seriously, like I think like uh, the proper documentation of the invasive species, the mechanisms of their spread, the mechanisms of their impact, quantification and economic uh, assessment of the impact on health, on food security, on environment, all that is just lacking in India today. So, uh, so I think there is, I mean, this is a very timely step that you've taken. And, uh, well, to conclude, I mean, like, you know, I wish you all the very best here. I would also like to, I mean, like, uh, you know, assure you of any support that you would require from Telangana government. I know the director would be like asking a question of his 78 acres in his mind. I have just spoken to the revenue secretary, he's told me he'll get back to me. So we'll expedite that. But you need to pursue that. Government has many compulsions and the <laughs> uh, CCMB land is not its topmost priority at time when floods and other things are challenging us. Every day there is a new challenge. It's interesting. Thank you very much for inviting me. I wish you a very good seminar. And once again, congratulations for a very like, effective uh, one lab, one week program that you've conducted. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajat Kumar, for the uh, insightful overview about how governments and research efforts can together help us manage invasive species. And I, I now uh, request Dr. Kartikeyan Vasudevan to kindly uh, felicitate our chief guest, Dr. Rajat Kumar. We shall now assemble in the lounge area for a group photograph followed by tea and we will assemble here back at 11 a.m. Thank you. I request all the speakers for the next talks to kindly give their presentation in pen drive.
Welcome back and now we shall begin with the talks for the day. So we have nine talks lined up. Each talk will be of 10 minutes followed by five minutes of discussion. We, we request the speakers to kindly speak to, uh, to stick to the time limit and we shall let the speaker know when two minutes is remaining at the end of the talk. The first talk of the day is by Shri Kali Charan S. Kardate, IAS, Member Secretary of Telangana Biodiversity Board. He will be speaking on aquatic biodiversity of Telangana. I welcome you, sir, to kindly give your talk. Sorry, forward, reverse, pointer. Hmm? Middle level, Thank you. Uh, good morning friends, uh, good morning everyone, uh, I am Kali Charan, uh, so I represent the Telangana State Biodiversity Board, uh, I am secretary since uh, last three years uh, in the organization. Uh, so today uh, I am going to talk on aquatic biodiversity in Telangana uh, per se. So as we all know uh, what is aquatic biodiversity, it refers to the variety and variabilities of uh, all the life forms. Okay. All the life forms found in the aquatic ecosystems and the Telangana being the landlocked uh, state we don't have uh, any marine ecosystem as such. So we have uh, uh, rivers basically two major rivers which uh, interestingly originate in Maharashtra. Uh, one is Godavari uh, which originates in Nasik district of Maharashtra and another one is Krishna which originates in uh, Sadara district of Maharashtra. Uh, the uh, Godavari uh, drains in the northern part of Telangana and uh, along with her tributaries as we know. Uh, then uh, uh, the another part uh, that is another river which uh, Krishna which flows through the southern part of the state and drains it uh, along with her tributaries. So uh, this is how uh, this map will uh, show. And along with that we have certain reservoirs uh, which can be uh, named as some uh, uh, water bodies and uh, wetlands also. Now wetlands we have a lot of confusion because recently Telangana state has formed a wetland authority in the state in 2019 and only uh, as they have listed more than 7000 but only we have listed 3 in the India portal. Uh, these 3 wetlands are uh, Manjira. Uh, uh, Sanctuary and uh, wildlife sanctuary, then uh, there is Pakhal Lake Sanctuary, and uh, one more is Kapra uh, Lake uh, or Kapra Wetland. Along with that, we have a uh, lot of uh, uh, you can say water bodies or lakes in the state. These lakes are uh, Procharam Lake, then uh, Pakhal Lake, then in state also, in um, capital also, we have Hussein Sagar, Osman Sagar, Himayat Sagar. Uh, total we can say that 24,189 water bodies are there in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the state and which uh, spread over the area of 5.72 lakh hectares and it includes 661 aquaculture ponds also and uh, it is spread over 830 hectares and rivers and canals also running through the length of about 4,818 kilometer uh, in the state. With this, uh, we can say that aquatic biodiversity of Telangana is uh, really interesting when we say about that. So we have aquatic flora, around uh, 432 species are there. Out of that, uh, around uh, 25 are invasive. And then uh, we have species of uh, 
zooplankton crabs and prawns around 87 then insect species we have 140 non marine mollusk we can see as 41 and uh, fishes we have 143 out of 12 are uh, categorized as uh, threatened species and uh, 12 are invasive also then amphibia we have 16 species and uh, one is invasive and two are uh, categorized as threatened reptiles we have seven and uh, nine are categorized are uh, uh, sorry uh, three are categorized as invasive so this is what uh, aquatic biodiversity in telangana roughly uh, looks like now uh, aquatic biodiversity when we talk about that uh, we see that uh, lot of challenges uh, are there when uh, we, we say that to uh, conserve the aquatic biodiversity in the state so like uh, uh, pollution because pollution forms a very important uh, aspect and in this uh, there is industrial pollution and then there are lot of uh, urbanization and then the pollution comes along with that and then we have uh, pollution from agriculture due to the increase uh, of uh, fertilizers and uh, non-organic uh, uh, pesticides and then uh, it will uh, deteriorate the uh, quality of water like uh, the biological oxygen demand and chemical oxygen demand then the total hardness, total uh, dissolved solids and total suspended solids all these factors which uh, which are very important for the uh, survival of the uh, aquatic biodiversity and its uh, quality this pollution will negatively affect and it will also negatively affect the uh, temperature of the water body which will also be very crucial because uh, if the aquatic body uh, or a water body do not have uh, requisite temperature water temperature then lot of uh, things will not happen accordingly like uh, metabolic and physiological activities like uh, reproduction seeding uh, then movements of aquatic organisms all are majorly dependent on this aquatic uh, temperature and again pH level will also be uh, hampered negatively which will again uh, create lot of problems then uh, water scarcity uh, when we talk about Telangana we know that uh, Telangana falls in uh, semi-arid uh, climatic zone so uh, historically seen uh, Telangana was actually uh, was a water scarcity, uh, scarcity areas or the state but uh, thanks to the two flagship programs of government of Telangana uh, named uh, Mission Kakatiya which is nothing but the rejuvenation of the water tanks existing water tanks which which had helped a lot to revive uh, those water bodies or water tanks and now uh, we are actually uh, you know running negatively or running uh, backwards from this water scarcity uh, threat and uh, in the coming down the line 10 years i would say that the picture will be very very uh, positive then another uh, uh, thing is that uh, uh, Harita Haram is one more flagship program which government of Telangana has taken uh, very very seriously and uh, we have seen that there is a lot of green coverage has come up and when there is a green coverage uh, uh, along with the burns along with the uh, uh, areas uh, where there were a lot of uh, you know uh, vacant land and barren land then automatically the water retention will be increased and it will also uh, help to you know uh, get the water bodies uh, revived so this is what happened over the period of time and again uh, this will uh, help a lot then uh, another challenge uh, we can see that over exploitation of resources as we all know that uh, sustainability uh, should be the ideal goal of uh, all of us but unfortunately uh, in every uh, aspect especially bio resources we see this uh, problem over exploitation of resources fishes as we say there is a you know over cultivation of fishes and then again uh, there is lot of other uh, uh, things also which has been you know uh, non-sustainable basis uh, they have been exploited uh, through these water bodies that is why this problem has uh, come and it has become a biggest challenge then species invasion uh, including alien species uh, the topic is all regarding this only as uh, 
uh, alien species are uh, uh, the menace to all these water bodies and uh, we know uh, um, uh, different uh, uh, hyacinth water hyacinth water lettuce uh, especially they have uh, they can be seen it's a very common picture in the uh, water bodies even in uh, hussein sagar we can see that or in other major lakes we can see that this will what will happen they will actually cover it uh, they will not allow any sunlight not allow any oxygen to come and then uh, it will kill automatically the biodiversity will be killed and uh, balance ecological balance will be disturbed and again uh, it will also lose the recreational value of that particular water body and again negatively hampered to the uh, tourism point of view also so all this problem will again uh, create due to that habitat destruction is uh, very important because there is one study which was done uh, in manjira wildlife sanctuary so that case study suggested that uh, habitat destruction is the major challenge uh, in the uh, disturbance of the aquatic biodiversity so what happens is that is habitat destruction basically because the agricultural fields rice fields which are near to that water body they will encroach upon that water body eventually and then uh, then again the river bank alteration will also happen and uh, again uh, uh, lot of uh, real estate mafias as we all know uh, uncontrolled kind of uh, 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 you know construction activities which are going on like uh, we can see in uh, aminpur lake uh, which is actually declared as a bhs uh, biological heritage site by government of telangana with the efforts of uh, uh, telangana state biodiversity board but still if uh, somebody goes there we can see that uh, this habitat destruction how it is happening and how the real estate they are actually trying to encourage upon that so with the uh, uh, all these issues uh, encroachment and reclamation of land because again uh, people wanted to you know uh, because with the increasing uh, size of population where we can stay how uh, how we will stay all these uh, issues will come up and slowly slowly encroachment land reclam reclamation and habitat destruction will become uh, uh, has become a major problem uh, problem and challenge uh, in the aquatic biodiversity climate change definitely yes because uh, we all know that there is a sizable increase in the temperature and how we have discussed just a while before how the temperature of the aquatic uh, um, uh, ecosystem is very important and even a slightest change in the temperature will lead to lot of problems and uh, climate change has de uh, has done it uh, so this has also become a, a big challenge uh, and we have to deal with that then lack of awareness and conservation efforts yes so the problem is that uh, we are taking it very lightly because um, okay encroachment is happening then uh, once upon a time hyderabad was known as the city of lakes now we hardly find any lake in hyderabad which is in a good condition where we can go for some recreational activities and uh, this happened only uh, in the last 20 to 30 years not more than that why it happened because of the lack of awareness and the conservation efforts because nobody wanted to conserve and nobody know how to do that and the conservation agencies like um, telangana state has the mandate telangana state biodiversity board has the mandate for the conservation but uh, we also not capacitate uh, enough and there is a gap of knowledge also there is a gap of you know because the regulating body they have they must be you know uh, with the truth because the toothless body you cannot expect that the regulation will happen in a way which we expect and then there is a lack of complete you know sensitization among the local leaders also because i feel that under until and because india is a democratic country in democratic setup you need to engage the community participation because we have to ensure that the community local community should be engaged and until and unless we do that uh, fortunately we have bmcs uh, that is biological uh, management committees at the local body level like uh, panchayats mandal then zps and also in the municipality level also we have but the, the leaders the people and the community at large they don't have uh, that kind of awareness so we have to work on this uh, uh, line to face this challenge then fragmentation of hydrological regime is also one of the challenge siltation and then unregulated recreation and tourism so this is also again you know very important uh, problem that uh, uh, all this uh, you know, tourism uh, activities which are happening at the cost of 
you know water bodies and uh, um, they are reclaiming those and then uh, uh, they are actually unchecked and uh, for you know um, uh, how they are managing is very very you know very very unfortunate and uh, this has to be checked because uh, this has growing like anything in the last five years i think this has become a very uh, big menace so unregulated recreation and tourism activities has to be stopped because the people uh, when they go for uh, any recreational activities or tourism activities they hardly care about the uh, because after i mean before and after if you see before the visit of the tourist and after that so you will see a lot of uh, you know, pollution uh, they have created plastic is one major menace along with that the actual um, water body is getting polluted in a number of uh, things then over harvesting this was i think it has been already discussed uh, through over exploitation of resources so yeah so now uh, these challenges are there but now how to deal with them what are the modes and measures to you know conserve the habitat uh, of the aquatic bi biodiversity and aquatic biodiversity in general so as i told that uh, uh, stakeholders participation so we have to uh, first enumerate or enlist which are the stakeholders in this uh, entire process so obviously generally i mean uh, uh, naturally government uh, agencies are one of the prominent stakeholders along with the fisheries department and forest department then obviously uh, uh, state biodiversity board uh, civic body like uh, municipalities and even gram panchayats a mandal praja parishad uh, body and then the uh, civil uh, society also i think important stakeholder and uh, ngos which are engaged in conservation uh, activities then uh, as i told local community is very very important because until unless we uh, ensure their participation nothing uh, could happen and then uh, uh, international agencies also we have to you know uh, make, make sure that they will also participate because um, this is a global uh, global issue and uh, their help has to be sought so all the stakeholders has to work together has to work in sync and uh, first thing is to sensitize them second thing is to ensure that the government agencies are uh, uh, are given enough powers to act upon uh, their uh, uh, their behalf and then civil uh, society are also uh, you know uh, uh, created enough awareness so that they will come forward and they will also uh, um, say that yes this is my uh, area this is my water body and i have uh, i mean i will conserve it for my own sake so uh, this kind of uh, awareness has to be ensured and uh, the enough and the fair set stakeholder participation has to be ensured so then again uh, they are implementing and enforcing water quality standards uh, to control pollution yes pcb i forgot pcb is also a very important stakeholder so all these things um, uh, as per the uh, standard uh, water quality measures we have to make sure that uh, they are actually implemented and enforced also so again this is a uh, you know government work uh, that is pcb will uh, uh, play a very crucial role in this but ngos and again local people they will keep a watch because until and unless we keep a watch because see when uh, we expect that government should work on their behalf yes certainly they will but then in the democratic state we forget that we have a duty also that we should have to keep a watch on them how they are doing if they are doing or not if not then what so uh, this is again a two way process and uh, in each and everything whenever we talk about the modes and measures i uh, i feel that until unless there is enough community participation nothing is going to happen only you know resting upon certain agency that they will act they will do and um, then it is their job not mine job this kind of attitude has to be forgotten and uh, has to you know uh, adopt the new or uh, other approaches then yes water management sustainable water management practices uh, everyone has to you know adopt those then first we have to define what are the sustainable water management practices and whom they should be actually and who are going to uh, actually you know uh, uh, practice those practices that has to be you know clearly clearly has to be mentioned and uh, this duty has to assign to each and everyone who are actually uh, part of this uh, Uh, water management sustainable water management practices 
Then regulating fishing is very important because uh, in lot of areas there is completely unregulated, unchecked kind of uh, uh, fishing going on uh, and that has to be dealt with uh, stern uh, uh, approach because uh, it, is not it is not sustainable then it is going to finish and uh, the complete aqua uh, biodiversity is going to you know uh, under a lot of threat. Then again conducive, uh, conducting invasive species monitoring this is what uh, this entire workshop or uh, this program I think is uh, uh, based upon. So all these uh, because there are I am not expert in this uh, subject uh, but uh, yes there might be you know uh, because a lot of study has already been done and uh, we have enough data on that data how we can act is the only question so execution I think is very important so we have data we have uh, we know where to go and what is the direction and uh, who will also act we all know only thing is that I told uh, execution is important and when execution will happen I think this uh, uh, minas will come down so this has to be uh, first uh, mm, uh, Dealt in because in the morning some speaker was telling about that uh, fishery is not only just uh, you know uh, uh, it is not just uh, a kind of one uh, animal or one species but it has become an industry. So industrial point of view when we think about that then we uh, uh, try to speak in terms of you know economic loss economic gain. So then if you measure uh, how much uh, loss we are incurring due to this invasive species then it will be uh, uh, really you, I mean it will shake your head and uh, then we will act I think so uh, this is also very important then establishing protected areas like uh, you know BHS so uh, biodiversity heritage site uh, as we have uh, uh, created in Aminpur uh, which was very uh, difficult because again uh, there is lot of uh, uh, vested interest of uh, politicians then uh, communities sometimes then local leaders and then obviously uh, 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 real estate mafia also it's unfortunate to tell I mean use this word but it is reality so all these uh, 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 factors when they act uh, it will the result will definitely it is negative but we have to make sure that uh, uh, we have to protect uh, these areas until unless we do that so a lot of political will was shown uh, by the government and board has took a lot of efforts also and that, that's why we have that BHS Aminpur and it is protected now. So a lot of work yet to be done I, I agree because a lot of fencing uh, need to be done, funding is required so funding is another area, another thing and we can have uh, I mean a lot of discussion on funding itself, how the funding will come uh, to all these uh, biodiversity related area I mean uh, projects but yes. So um, this uh, can be done, so uh, through this effect actually uh, some kind of production will be uh, make uh, sure. Then use of diagnostic approaches for defining management approach and actions, yes. Governance, yes definitely because governance is very important. Uh, political will, uh, until unless there is a political will and the positive approach from the administration, nothing uh, will happen on the ground. So everything will remain in the book itself because we will have lot of studies. Now CCND has um, either being, being a research uh, institution, they have n number of studies I am sure and uh, every year uh, they will be coming up with new studies, it's a good thing. But then until unless there is a political will, enough you know, political will and positive approach from the administration, this studies will remain in the book itself, it will remain in the um, their, their uh, study manuals. So uh, governance has to be uh, uh, made effective, again I am telling that the pressure should be put from the people because they can again community participation because people if they won't raise the voice how the government will you know because sometimes the government because government has different commitments government will think differently I am not telling that government is not willing but uh, to make them realize that no this is an important issue and this has to be dealt now because we don't have time because biodiversity I think there is already time has gone Anna. So now we have to act because we are act already acting very late. So until unless there is uh, enough uh, pressure from the civil society, from the people, from the local uh, uh, community, uh, this positive governance and the action from the government will not happen and it will remain uh, as such. So I was talking about uh, uh, BHS uh, in Aminpur 
So some activities we have undertaken there, uh, these are the snapshots of that. So BMC is a good structure actually uh, under the Biodiversity uh, Act 2002 by Government of India. Uh, the problem is that we have BMCs to be very frank, I mean this is a close group, so I would share, I would like to share. BMCs are basically, I mean to be very frank, they are only on paper, they are not functional enough. So unfortunately I have to state this. Uh, but uh, why it happened, uh, because uh, again it will take lot of, uh, lot of sensitization first and then lot of funding will require to actually make BMC functional. But still uh, we, we ensure that uh, in the sensitive areas where there is actually a threat to uh, biodiversity conservation uh, in some cases like uh, Neknampur Lake, Aminpur Lake. So we made sure that the BMC are actually acti activated and they along with them we uh, undertake some activities. So these are the things uh, um, which, have, which we have undertaken. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the patient hearing. And uh, this is from my side. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, yes. Mm. Yeah. So you yeah. mentioned about the VHS sites. So, what is the legal sensitivity for the BHSS? Is there any? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Can you give pro protection? Can you book a case if there is any violation of the law? Uh, okay. The, under Section 37, we all know that uh, Biodiversity Act, uh, there is a mention of BHS. And uh, the entire guidelines regarding BHS have not yet come up. Uh, it is under process. And NBA, that is National Biodiversity Authority Chennai, they are coming up with the larger guidelines to uh, actually uh, give some idea how the BHS will work, whether it is a legal unit or not and a number of things. Now the in the existing act ma'am, uh, yes certainly there are actually uh, some uh, penal provisions which we can initiate against one who will act uh, or violate the provisions enumerated under the uh, section 37 uh, regarding BHS. But now the new act uh, will definitely have, you know, they have diverted, they have completely repealed all the uh, penalty measures and legal action won't be possible. But yes, there is a provision for fine, larger fine and uh, that way. So I think to speak uh, with the existing terms, yes, certainly there are certain. So every, for, for Amin, like you said, there are a lot of violations. Any yes. By the, the problem again, I am telling you because this uh, case has to be because Suomoto we can yes we can register, but again um, uh, there are uh, community participation as I was telling. So we are uh, not in uh, the position because board to be very frank, uh, we are a regulating body, but then we have our own. Uh, limitations and then uh, in the present uh, pretext it's very difficult for us you know to highlight those kind of things because we are urging and we have the proposals is pending since last three years i think to the government we are asking for some 78 lakh rupees for the fencing itself and uh, the fencing is not yet the fund has not been sanctioned so we are con continuously are pursuing uh, let us see how it will works anybody else Thank you very much. Thank you, Shri Kalcharan, for the wonderful talk, uh, which gave us, gave us an overview about the practical challenges faced by aquatic biodiversity and the possible solutions. And I request Dr. Umapati to kindly felicitate our speaker. The second talk of the day is by Professor Biju Kumar from University of Kerala. He will sp be speaking on the aquatic invasion species, invasive species of India and invasion biology, status, knowledge gap and policy limits. I request you sir to kindly take over. Okay. 
मैं बताता हूँ सर ये फॉरवर्ड है गुड मॉर्निंग फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल थैंक्स टू सी सी एम बी फॉर द इन्विटेशन एंड ऑल्सो फॉर अरेंजिंग दिस टॉपिक फॉर अ डिस्कशन एंड आई प्रिपेयर फॉर फिफ्टीन मिनट्स बट आई विल ट्राई टू फिनिश इट ऑफ इन टाइम एंड द स्पीशी द टॉपिक ऑफ कोर्स एस द डिस्कशन फ्रॉम द राइट फ्रॉम द मॉर्निंग सेज इट्स वेरी रिलेवेंट एस्पेशली इन द इंटरनेशनल सिनारियो बिकॉज इंडिया इज कमिटेड विथ सी बी डी एग्रीमेंट एंड अदर एग्रीमेंट्स एंड ऑल्सो इफ यू लुक एट द पॉलिसी इश्यूज कनेक्टेड विद कन्वेंशन ऑन बायोलॉजिकल डाइवर्सिटी एंड इट्स टारगेट विच इज सपोज टू बी अचीव बाई ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी बट वी डिड नॉट अचीव एंड देन इट इज पॉस्पोन टू ट्वेंटी फिफ्टी एंड देन होप फुली वी आर गोइंग टूवर्ड्स दैट डायरेक्शन एंड ऑल्सो इफ यू लुक एट the ipbs report and other subsequent reports on including at our state and marine biodiversity it is one of the identified as one of the larger challenges or you can, you can say it, this is a biodiversity sticking time bomb uh, in the civilian species and also the economic losses which we discussed in the morning itself and then the, the first i i'll start with the question why aquatic invasive fauna get li- little attention and the reason is that uh, you know the the presence is not very well noticed compared to that in the terrestrial system and because many other things are happening below the water and then the changes you know we will not actually realize the things initially and second is uh, you know we, when we speak about aquatic invasive species we often limit our discussion to fish alone but that is not the scenario we have a large number of taxa in in, in the water and the, and and for that uh, we don't have taxonomic expertise in many of the groups for example we have only one only one um, um, uh, the freshwater mollus expert he is here available in india and similarly the scenario is uh, like that you know limitation in taxonomic impediment and also there is apathy for the freshwater ecosystems in general and then who are the culprits and are we not indirectly uh, doing it and for example in the in the name of promotion of uh, aquaculture uh, we indirectly actually introduce a large number of aquatic species and for more promotion of ornamental species again indirectly we promote uh, all these kind of uh, alien species without due consideration for its uh, economic and other ecological you know the the causes and then you know then we don't have yet Uh, after a larger number of years of blue revolution we have no confidence in indigenous species in standardizing the breeding protocol etc etc and these are the things because i am also part of the community uh, because i also teach it is part of my bread and butter fisheries but yet i have to speak that this is the scenario and also uh, ignorance on invasion biology even though we speak about invasion biology uh, there is no so much serious studies as far as india is concerned i will come to that later and also you know we always project short term economic project actions for the fishery sector but not in the long term the ecological consequences as as a result of invasive species and then when you look at this curve which is uh, which will be discussed in in uh, the why this seminar or workshop or discussion all about is actually if you really wanted to uh, cut the or manage invasive alien species we have to start at this stage of uh, the detection itself otherwise once it establishes the population it's very difficult to control and that is why the relevance of this uh, topic and also it's uh, you know the multiple roles particularly when you look at the food security and also health of the ecosystem and the livelihood of the people and it are the remain interconnected and that is the reason why we need to have uh, more attention on this particular kind of species and then i will quickly go through some of the major aquatic invasive group in addition to the uh, the fauna sorry flora i am not discussing now but if you look at that then you, the primary thing always uh, moves around fishes and then we have mollusks we have another talk uh, and then uh, we have crustaceans we have limited uh, information on that parasitic worms and you know, all the, the microbial and other disease causing agents transmitted through the invasive species we have only few records but there may be many and also amphibians why i put amphibians here this is now one of the more uh, mostly traded item in the aquarium shops so this is again there is a chance for its entry into the system and the turtles again one species of uh, concern which we will discuss uh, later and you know then the problem is actually to uh, consider or delineate invasive and uh, you know the, the uh, alien species and invasive species as of now uh, we consider the species which established its population and causes uh, impacts on the biodiversity and economic uh, uh, scenario and uh, we can say that uh, for confirmation there may be around 10 species which are fish which are established as invasive okay there may be other species which may be uh, listed the alien species but they could not they may 
not have been invasive. For example, you goldfish. In many of the ecosystem, goldfish is there, but there is no record that goldfish will cause some kind of negative impacts on the ecosystem, etc., etc. But we need um, further studies to establish that. And growing species wise, you know, I'm just quickly go through that. One is one species which is established already all over India, right from the, uh, the last th three, four decades or five decades is actually the Mozambique tilapia, which is already there and it is almost indigenous now, primarily because it's almost there in every pond and replacing them is not, should not be the primary priority, primarily because it's very difficult, okay, and, and also it support the livelihood, etc, etc, so uh, that is it, and second species which is not formally, legally introduced in India, but people everywhere use it, and that is Nile tilapia and, uh, you know, the, uh, and also the, we have, you know, the gift tilapia, which is nothing but Nilotikus, but uh, again, cultured extensively, and their entry into the uh, system need to be uh, watched in, in uh, the uh, due course of time. And also remember in many of the northern Indian larger rivers and this is the only species which support the livelihood of the people because you know because the, the we should also understand the ecosystem is changing and this ecosystem is fully exploited by the species which are highly adapted particularly when they have no predators and then they have some accessory uh, respiratory and survival mechanisms. And other species which support you know the Indian economy considerably is the common carp, the Cyprinus carpio and which is there in mo almost all the, uh, the uh, indigenous uh, water bodies and uh, uh, it is a threat. I will come to that, you know, especially uh, in, in, when the indigenous population is there and this is a typical example of one uh, uh, temple in uh, Kerala where this, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, local indigenous species Masir is uh, protected and then now the species is uh, the, the Cyprinus carpio uh, actually invaded into every ecological niche available there and then it's a, there is a larger competition that is another thing uh, especially when you, you need to have a larger invasion biology uh, research uh, have, uh, to be happen and then the guppy and guppy we don't have a single publication which actually established that it has a, a threat it is actually a threat but you know indirectly globally it is in the 100 uh, most uh, invasive species list and also it's a prolific feeder particularly they feed on the egg of the indigenous species and yet we promote that all the health departments promote that for introduction because yet we have a large number of larvivorous species available in India but we promote that primarily because we don't have we have a standardized mechanism uh, to promote our breeding protocol available for the indigenous fish like Aplogelus or Macropodus for that matter and similarly the mosquito fish uh, the introduced primarily for controlling mosquito larvae but we don't have any invasive uh, uh, biology studies on this species to say that it is a, a real threat but throughout the world there are some other papers which clearly establish that it is a threat and one of the species which CCMB is also initiated work is actually the uh, the, the gare, Clarius uh, garepenis and then it's there in almost all the major uh, river, uh, aquatic systems in India and there is also a, a possibility of crossbreeding with indigenous species and also there is no potential predators and you know in many of the systems they they invade in large numbers and replace almost all the species there and uh, like that you know many of the some of the temple ponds uh, in, in Kerala where you can see the population has already replaced many of the uh, other species available and then you know the people you know even start feeding them primarily because it's in the temple pond and uh, it's a species to be worshipped and then yeah and then the, the uh, we, we have a, a another scenario in another reservoir in Kerala which is within the protected area and where the, there is only invasive species now and uh, you know it's uh, uh, invasive species dominating a uh, system and then it's an interesting study uh, area to study on the impact of multiple species inhabiting the same system and how will it impact the ecology and then we established that and we forwarded the hypothesis and the reason is very simple if you look at the natural predators of uh, African catfish uh, throughout the world you can see that none of the species are available in, in uh, India and then that means they have no natural predators and they prol the prolifically breed and uh, establish and then in a system like uh, a reservoir uh, we hypothesize that you know when there are only invasive species they feed upon each other and survive in the system and make the system suitable for the invasion of other species also and this hypothesis is, is often referred to as the melting down hypothesis and that is also happening in many of the uh, ecosystem and only this kind of uh, the invasion biology studies will ultimately give you some some intricate details of uh, uh, the things another species which is uh, again CCMB is doing some work is the, the armored uh, catfish which is there in almost all the ecosystem 
ecosystems, uh, all the major wetlands in India and such. And in, in fact, you know, if you look at the history of invasion of this particular species, in the shortest period, this is the most dangerous species. And also, uh, even though it is not a carnivorous species, but it is highly competent and they replace uh, the Indian species in uh, many of the species, many of the day. And this is our uh, study on the invasion biology. is already published. They make uh, tunnels in the uh, in, in the uh, side walls, so the uh, ecosystems, and uh, highly, uh, you know, they, they show parental care and survival is also guaranteed. And this is how they work. Uh, this is invasion biology of this particular uh, species. And also very complicated, uh, you know, taxonomy. Primarily because they are traded across the, uh, uh, you know, systems, and uh, there are uh, few species, and there are hybrids. Large number of hybrids available in the system. It's very interesting to look at the uh, the population genetics and how they, uh, you know, ultimately the gene flow happens into the systems, etc. These are the things to be uh, studied. And also some of the invasion biology studies, like population dynamics, is also very very important. So when we did the population study, it, we, we, it could be established that removing adult fish is not that important but uh, removing the smaller fish is more important in managing the population etc. So it tells us the importance of uh, biology studies. This uh, Raji will uh, uh, speak more about that, particularly some of the, uh, the protected area where only uh, dominated primarily by the invasive species and some of the uh, possible species but we don't have database where probably we have to work on the invasion biology, particularly that of grass carp, silver carp etc. Whether they had, they had al already become invasive in India and there are some uh, media hypes that they found uh, the Piranha here, it's not an active piranha, but things like that. You know, media hypes, and we, we need to uh, tell the science behind that ultimately. And then we need a more climate is as explained. Climate is, an, uh, is a scenario which ultimately, uh, you know. Uh, speed up the whole invasion process and uh, we have some studies going on uh, to show how climate change will ultimately uh, impact the distribution of the species in the western guards as you can see uh, you know the species uh, richness towards the southern part of the western guards at the same time you know the uh, our study shows that distribution of the uh, the alien species across the western guards and uh, uh, then the scenario we worked out based on the hydro basins as well and this also shows us that you know the, the potential of invasion is so severe especially in areas rich in the, uh, endemism and these are the primary uh, routes of transfer and as you can see the primary route is the aquarium trade which Raji will explain in uh, detail and aquaculture and you know then we have mosquito control, aquarium, uh, sport fishing and garden ponds and these are the reasons through which uh, we uh, introduce fish uh, into this uh, system and some of the species which to look at for future is uh, this species the, the uh, red eared slider he is now invading many of the wetlands in Kerala primarily through the aquarium trade and uh, uh, something to be uh, noticed for future and also some of the uh, where Dr. Anil will speak primarily on the marine species and this is a species now in the last one decade expanding like anything in the estuarine systems throughout India. Uh, particularly the invasive species called Ch Mycenlax trigata. It is, uh, you know, now throughout, uh, because it um, uh, multiply very fast and, uh, you know, this is the kind of scenario, it invade aquaculture systems and all the other, uh, and, and then there are alternatives to that, uh, I, uh, there's no time to discuss. And there are, in future again, there is, uh, plastic is on a major menace and, uh, you know, there are large number of invasive species carried with the plastic debris and they are, there is a new terminology also coming up, this is called the uh, neopelagic communities, which actually leaves new communities developed along with uh, marine plastics and then they float and then they migrate and plastisphere is another area where CCMD can take up a work pa how pathogens are transported along with the uh, the uh, microplastics across the uh, oceans etc and then probably in the discussion we may also have to include some of the aquatic plants primarily because of aquarium trade uh, they are now occurring in many of the water bodies Parasites and pathogens are uh, another area where probably we can uh, study. And I will conclude with uh, you know some of the suggestions for management uh, of the invasive species. And one of the prerequisites definitely as this workshop uh, says is detection and early detection primarily using modern uh, tools. And also uh, for impressing the policy makers, these molecules are not enough. We need to speak in terms of economics. And the economic analysis of the impact of the, uh, the invasive species is something probably we need to work together in a multidisciplinary manner. Uh, to impress the policy makers and also you know the identification of the hot uh, areas of where uh, management intervention is required because we don't have money for intervention everywhere so we need to identify the hot spot of uh, the invasive alien species with the proper uh, economic uh, evaluation and also with the uh, impressive uh, the database
etc and also how to bring in science and societal engagement and policy uh, linkage this is something where probably we need to focus our attention how we can work out all these things science society engagement and policy linkage how we can work out this cycle well uh, so that you know we can ultimately come up with a uh, policy and the synergy uh, question this the question of synergy and also the in as program um, the management cycle we need science outreach uh, surveillance and detection response management and risk mitigation because as you know the education play a very very important role throughout the world there are citizen scientists involvement and uh, the the awareness activities parallelly initiated uh, to manage and there are uh, some of the suggestions which probably you can look at uh, uh, in the discussion in the afternoon what are the research focus areas uh, where we need discussion and i finally conclude with some of the research, very interesting research paper which i came across and you know these are two points one is research uh, you know output and research priorities are something different because we have large number of papers coming up on the impacts okay at the same time we have lesser number of uh, uh, papers research papers coming up on uh, the preventing the spread of the species and early detection and that is why this uh, this workshop this discussion is very very important rather than publishing few information about the new species record here and there we need to have stronger publications on the prevention strategies and also the the detection strategies and control measures and also as you can see towards the end the economics of all these uh, activities okay and there is no dearth of uh, regulations as far as india is concerned quite a lot but only thing is the implementation part we fail miserably and for example if you look at the policies specifically for invasive avian species right from 1898 there are quite a lot and also uh, but what we need is actually an overarching policy on invasive species for india and actually this uh, started it was initiated by national biodiversity authority few years back where dr anil and me were members and then ultimately uh, the, there is a policy document prepared by nba and uh, nothing actually happen towards implementing or bringing out a policy probably uh, we can try together to uh, revisit that and already the nba said he has a very strong um, focus on managing invasive avian species again so probably uh, prioritizing that and don't know iucn has come up with a very interesting uh, scenario it's called IAC iacat environmental impact classification of alien uh, species that also uh, probably we can uh, try and ultimately uh, i am sure that this uh, uh, this this uh, discussion or workshop will ultimately come up with uh, uh, long term management strategies for invasive avian species thank you so much That was an interesting talk. Thank you. You mentioned that the uh, invasive species like the catfish don't have any predators, so they keep multiplying and growing, and are causing harm. What about uh, are they edible? I think the biggest predator will be humans. We can consume them and reduce their populations. Uh, yeah, but you know why the uh, African catfish is not uh, of that much demand primarily because we tasted the indigenous uh, the catfish and that is the reason why in many of the uh, states of india the people reject it primarily because it is not tasty and also they look at the way in which it is it is cultured in the aquaculture systems by giving slaughterhouse waste and that is another reason which which prevent the you know normal consumer from uh, staying away from this particular species that could be another reason thank you We'll discuss later. I don't know. There is a lot of things. It's like they say it's a ban on eating some of these catfish uh, because they are not. Uh, they're toxic and things like that. So how much of that is true? Uh, I don't know. I don't know the science of that. Toxicity can be established only through a scientific study. You know how much heavy metal is there and how much uh, uh, microbial load is there, etc., etc. I, I don't know. There's no, no harm in eating a catfish. Uh, no issue. You know, you have, it is not different from other fish. You know, it's similar to the accumulation is similar to uh, that happened with uh, any other species in that matter. Uh, we can discuss further outside later during the lunch time. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so our next, uh, I request Dr. Kartikeya uh, Vasudevan to kindly felicitate our speaker. I once again request all the speakers to kindly uh, maintain the time limit because we have a lot of talks to accommodate. 
and uh, our next speaker of the day is Dr. Rajiv Raghavan from KUFOS and he will be talking about aquarium pet industry and biological invasions in India. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. So, uh, I think Dr. Biju has already set a, a foundation uh, for this uh, uh, workshop and I am just going to talk about one small uh, subsector within the uh, industry which is the interactions between aquarium pet trade and uh, biological invasions. So, uh, from humble beginnings in China, the trade has now uh, you know, become one of the most important uh, commerce or uh, industries in the world and it's a billion dollar industry and it continues to expand uh, every day and you can see the, the economics of the uh, trade uh, and uh, how important it is not only from the fisheries industry perspective but also from a, a larger uh, global uh, commerce uh, perspective so we've got a, a range of species involved right from uh, extremely small you know economical uh, fish to fish that are uh, fish that fetch you know probably uh, millions uh, so it's a range of species that are involved and uh, most importantly uh, more than a biodiversity perspective uh, aquarium trade uh, the pet industry is also now uh, linked to human uh, well-being so it is also important from uh, the social uh, well-being perspective uh, as well but um, the most important biodiversity impact of the trade is um, how these aquarium pets finally end up in uh, native uh, ecosystems or habitats and they uh, tend to threaten the native uh, species or even uh, endemic and threatened species in many parts of the world. So there's been a lot of literature on how aquarium pet trade has uh, impacted uh, the native uh, biodiversity in many regions of the world. And this should only keep uh, increasing or expanding because of the global trade. So we have uh, you know uh, airplanes and you know ships and all these uh, international traffic that is uh, expanding and I'm sure species will be transformed from one region to another in a very short uh, span of time uh, within hours, within days, uh, etc. So this is basically a brief of what uh, aquatic invasions have cost the, uh, the world. So it has cost the global economy around 345 billion uh, US dollars uh, till now and as I said it is uh, increasing, it will only increase. Uh, so the latest figures are around 23 uh, billion US dollars in 2020. And then, for example, if you look at this, uh, one example of how much one species has cost or the impacts of one, uh, economic impacts of one eradication program, uh, for example, in Queensland, uh, of the red-eared slider turtle, which Dr. Biju has already shown in one of his slides, has cost, cost around $1 million, uh, which when compared to the GDP of some countries, you can see, so how much of money every, uh, or even small governments are spending to control uh, invasive uh, species. So around 17% uh, of uh, alien uh, fish species establishments around the world are a result of aquarium pet trade and Dr. Biju already had a, a pie chart that showed you that aquarium pet trade is the most significant uh, pathway or source of uh, aquatic invasions uh, worldwide. And so these are some of the pathways very quickly. So uh, fish tend to escape or uh, you know jump out of uh, breeding systems, farms, hatcheries from uh, so retail outlets are also another source of uh, escapees of fish. And you have uh, garden ponds, another uh, source and pathway for uh, aquarium pets. So we have large uh, aquarium uh, expos or exhibitions that happen in many parts of the world. And most often what happens is uh, we see local exhibitions in, in different states where people tend to just uh, you know, dump these fish before they uh, go out from the city, and which again is a major uh, pathway. Uh, the most important uh, risk from uh, aquarium pet trade is what we call as tank buster species that have uh, a tendency to grow to extremely large sizes and therefore they cannot be held in an aquarium after a certain uh, period of time. So they tend to come as small juvenile, but then they uh, grow uh, fairly fast, rapidly and then you are no longer in a position to hold them in uh, home aquariums or smaller uh, uh, systems and therefore this is what uh, happens when uh, these fish cannot be you know held in aquariums and people have this mentality of releasing them into a natural uh, water body which is very close uh, to where these fish are kept and so this has resulted in for example from uh, Kerala we have uh, incidences of large uh, mega fish which I call tank busters in the previous slide now appearing in uh, rivers, lakes, uh, wetlands uh, etc. So it is not only really, uh, growing in size but also the there is another problem with aquarium hobbies that they tend to get uh, 
I'm tired of certain fish after keeping it for a few months or for a few years. Many people want to try many new uh, species. So uh, this is also another mentality that uh, exists within the hobby. And also some of these fish have excessive breeding habits. They, they, they breed very profusely. So you know they tend to come as five fish. They multiply into 50 or 100 in a very quick point of time. And then the aquariums are no longer in a capacity to hold uh, these fish. So uh, lots of behavioral uh, attitudes that we need to change. Uh, Dr. Buji already uh, touched upon the existing uh, policies, so it is not that we don't have policies, but it is mostly the failure of policies or the failure of implementation of policies that we have to take into uh, consideration. We also have to link all these to you know, international policies like uh, CITES, uh, etc. There is also another uh, part two, which is the, uh, the increase of online sales of aquarium fish. Uh, lots of uh, you know, online uh, you know, outlets where you can buy uh, fish, any fish that you want. For example, even uh, threatened species fish that uh, you know, come from the Amazon, from Yangtze, from Mekong. All of the uh, rivers uh, in the world are easily available you know, through Amazon or eBay or Snapdeal. So including all these uh, fish, uh, the, the Amazonian uh, catfishes, uh, the Arapaima, so they are all available as juveniles in the uh, online. Uh, trade. So these are just uh, snapshots of you know uh, how much these fish cost. So thirty-five thousand dollars for an albino stingray fish from the Amazon, easily available uh, online. There's also another emerging party which are the stone quarries, the big uh, mining quarries that happen, uh, for example, in Kerala where they culture lots of uh, you know these mega fish, including uh, arapaimas, which uh, are uh, you know uh, dangerous because this is also a region which has been experiencing catastrophic floods over the years. So we have extreme climatic events, which will finally help or you know facilitate their uh, entry into uh, natural uh, water bodies. So this is a work uh, done by Dr. Buju's PhD student where all of us were involved in looking at uh, where these aquarium uh, mediated species are distributed uh, in, in Kerala for example and you can see it is all over the place right from the south to north not uh, you know just concentrated in one locality all rivers have these uh, species and again some of the studies that we did where we linked these floods the extreme climatic events uh, and we showed that uh, you know aquaculture aquarium pet trade the existence of uh, hatcheries uh, very close to the river systems where there's no biosecurity any of these uh, you know uh, arrangements in place to stop uh, escapees of fish so all of them have finally uh, entered into natural uh, water bodies like rivers wetlands lakes uh, etc and this would only increase given the uh, predictions of extreme climatic events in uh, southern india and different parts of the western world for example so whole list of uh, species which were you know uh, present in the natural water bodies pre and post uh, extreme uh, climatic events including alligator gar has become a, a common appearance in many of the uh, river bodies in uh, kerala so all these are again snapshots of uh, videos on YouTube, etc., from where you can get this fish for sale. Uh, this is a sturgeon, uh, a European fish, which is now available online uh, to buy. Uh, there are you know alligator gas, arapaimas. All of this is extremely easy to get, uh, you know, uh, for a couple of uh, hundred uh, rupees. So this is uh, a paper that we published 15 years ago, probably 14, 15 years ago, not to be you, myself, uh, lots of other uh, people together, where we, uh, you know, set a stage, told that there is an issue, uh, you know, way back in 2009, but this uh, has not yet uh, come up in policy making or other things. So this is 2023, a very recent paper where uh, they've, uh, yeah, I'll just finish in a minute. 600 species of uh, aquarium fish have been recorded uh, in the country, out of which four have been already declared as invasive, and it will only be, uh, you know, uh, time before many other uh, species will also uh, become uh, invasive in, in the country. So I'm sure Dr. Anil will talk about uh, ballast water management convention and all that. So I think we need an equivalent of that in freshwater uh, systems. We don't have an overarching policy like Dr. Biju uh, said. So this is a very interesting, uh, you know, um, a practice that is being done by the Kerala Forest Research Institute where they are uh, you know, holding uh, all the ready and slider turtles. Uh, they are giving public notices to people to, you know, uh, not to release them in the wild and they will bring them back to the uh, holding facility in Kerala Forest Research Institute where they uh, maintain. So, you know, uh, engaging the public is extremely important. We have to change human behavior so because all of these are human mediated releases. Uh, Human psychology is something that uh, we should understand. So, we scientists don't normally work with that uh, uh, understanding 
So this is uh, you know what we have in our public aquarium in our university. So we try to educate uh, people not to uh, put uh, these fish back into the environment. So last uh, you know week I was in the UK. I was you know, happy to see this in one of the uh, you know train uh, washrooms where they said don't f flush goldfish into uh, the toilet. So these are extremely interesting uh, public engagement notices where we can help uh, understand or change the behavior of uh, people, uh, especially children or you know or kids of that age when you know they see that this is what we need to do so we need to engage uh, the common public in a more uh, sensible uh, manner uh, and this is just my last slide just to uh, you know um I suggest a few things that we can take up during the uh, discussion in the afternoon. One is, uh, you know, obviously, Dr. Buju mentioned about a national overarching policy on aquarium uh, pet trade. So there are several countries which have what is known as white list and black list. So species that can be uh, imported into the country, species that cannot be imported into the country. So we do not have such a list uh, as yet in the country. So we have to have these white list and black list for aquarium uh, trade. Then uh, we have so, so much of aquarium fish in, uh, in holding facilities already. So we need to have an audit of these facilities to see what kind of fish are available there. For example, arapaimas, alligator gas, all of this are uh, fish that are not legally allowed to be imported or kept uh, in the country. But we have still lots of facilities which have these. So an auditing is extremely important on a national uh, level. Campaigns, as I said, social media campaigns, uh, educational campaigns, uh, awareness programs are all extremely important to uh, change the social or human uh, behavior of this. So yeah, so we'll take up this during our uh, discussions in the afternoon. So thank you very much for this opportunity. We have time for a few questions. Any questions? I have a question. Do you think Kerala uh, Biodiversity Board is uh, looking at uh, to control this one? Mm, not in my knowledge, there is uh, nothing. <laughs> they, we had a, a national workshop, uh, national conference, uh, solely focused on uh, alien invasive species uh, last year, where Dr. Biju and I were there for the discussion. So, you know, it is always in that level. So, we have not yet come to the level of uh, you know implementing things on the ground. So, it has always stayed within rooms like this, where we keep discussing things, but uh, you know, nothing has gone beyond uh, that level. So, I think that is what we have to uh, you know do at the next stage. <laughs> Yeah. No, no problem. Sure. I do not understand many of the details of this. So, a very nice question. Is Kerala the only state where studies on alien invasive species is happening? No, 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 no. It's just that because you know, to be you and I happen to be from Kerala, we gave examples of uh, you know uh, things that are happening there. But I'm sure you know Karnataka Dr. Arivind will be talking about the Karnataka and other parts of the country as well. So I think there are lots of studies being conducted in different parts, but they are all isolated. They are not coordinated in any way. So I think this will be a perfect platform and opportunity to actually coordinate all the work that has been happening in different parts of the world. So it is uh, parts of the country. So it is not that it is not happening. It is definitely happening. But uh, yeah. yeah. For example, take the case of armored catfish. Is there in almost all the right from the Cal Calcutta to uh, you know the southern part of India? Yeah. So, uh, so the, and also African catfish. It's there. So yeah, there are all these catfish studies, but not. Yeah, a focused uh, coordinated pan India study is not uh, yet available. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, yeah. uh, sir, for the talk. I request Dr. Umapati to kindly felicitate Dr. Raghavan. <coughs> Our next talk of the day is by Dr. J. A. Wilson from Wildlife Institute of in India and he will be talking on ecological impacts of invasive fish species. So good afternoon to all. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Mohabadi and Dr. Karthik for taking this initiative. Uh, in fact, in the last 15 years, uh, this is the fifth uh, consultative meeting I am attending actually. Uh, even uh, Hyderabad itself, uh, this is the second one. Uh, five years back, uh, NBA along with ICR institution, they have organized one program. And uh, I am very sad, <laughs> sadly speaking, still we are in the same level actually. But over the last 15 years, uh, the invasive species, you know, they have taken over many places. Way back in 2008, uh, you know, that was the first time in Ganga we have, you know, recorded uh, the self in catfishes. Very rare to find actually. But now if you go into most of the stretches, you have a self in catfishes actually. So they are very proactive when compared to us actually. That is the uh, situation. We are not doing anything for the aquatic conservation. 
so coming to the invasive species um, the uh, i am uh, my talk is no more related to ecology how you know they are behaving in the ecology basically any invasive species we have so many uh, introduced species uh, so normally you know uh, they are called you now case selected species actually uh, they grow very rapidly they multiply very fast actually the fecundity rate will be you know, very high and they have a special uh, parental care mechanism like for example uh, the self in catfish uh, and even tilapia so they take care uh, you know the all the inguants they ensure that they will know uh, the probable should you know uh, reach and the gene should be you know retained in the environment actually and most of them are generalist actually they eat whatever the stuff uh, which is available in the environment that is the uh, you know uh, advantage of uh, the invasion actually uh, right from algal to you know uh, it will eat uh, whatever the even uh, debris uh, the other uh, animals so they are generalist uh, not only for the feeding habit even the environment also from saline water to you will uh, find in the you know even pristine water actually so they have a plasticity in the adopting the different environment that is the survival strategy whether it is a even uh, invasive plant if you take a prosophis okay and uh, most of the invasive species they behave like that actually that is the strategy they have and coming to the impact of biology and growth <coughs> first slowly you know they occupy the uh, the, uh, the vacant uh, niches okay so wherever we didn't wait actually and then slowly put uh, the pressure on the uh, the existing uh, the species biodiversity especially the aquatic fishes you uh, know uh, uh, maybe uh, they may be like an insectivorous i can give an example like a brown trout which is uh, quite uh, common in the himalayan headwater that is also invasive species so basically they are ins insectivorous just like you know, we have our own native species the berylius or uh, danios you will find in the surface uh, feeding uh, build so they uh, compete with uh, this group actually second thing they are very aggressive so same our native native species uh, they are not aggressive actually so they coexist with the other surface uh, you know feeding guild actually so this uh, guy you know they are very aggressive and the, over the period the competition is started you no know, uh, eating uh, the eggs and young ones of other animals if the uh, the you know resources uh, scar or resources you no know, limited so that's kind of you no know, uh, the pressure it will put slowly then completely take over the uh, the other uh, species niche so one example one of my phd students he has done uh, work on the uh, the invasion biology of the brown trout versus uh, native trout so himalaya we have a native trout it is called uh, snow trout so the entirely different group actually the the uh, the brown trout is actually salmonite salmonite okay so totally different family and then uh, this uh, uh, snow trout is cypnid uh, carp family just like you know they cutla rogu that family actually so the biology is and uh, uh, the you know the, uh, the 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 ecology everything is totally different uh, they are you know the surface feeder and this fellow is you know uh, the the brown trout is surface feeder but this our native one is you no know, bottom feeder algal feeder though they have a different uh, feeding niche but the presence of these two species in the same environment that put lot of pressure on the uh, species so we have selected like the where we have both species population and then another one without a um, uh, population that is like a control actually only our native uh, snow trout alone is there. so what we have found the the, uh, the pressure on the biology of the native species actually okay first of all no the the uh, the reproduction the egg okay the fecundity as well as the egg size normally in the uh, the uh, snow trout without any biological pressure so you'll have like a larger ovum okay but because of the pressure the size of the ovum in the you know, type uh, the uh, stage 5 stage more you know small size actually the size is you no know, uh, uh, decreasing second thing uh, um, the um, maturity so normally in natural system the uh, snow trout yearly twice they you know ready to spawn actually the post monsoon and during winter actually so you'll have a, a uh, the gonadotropic index that will tell about the you know the maturity stage and it will tell when it will go spawning actually so throughout the year we have examined the 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 place where only we have a snow trout uh, it's perfect actually naturally you have a two uh, spawning season but the where you have a brown trout 
with the pressure in the environment so they are not spawning actually throughout the year we are retaining so any time if you collect and see the conidal stomatic index will be high actually there is a pressure actually pressure on the the biology of the thing actually so the animal is not trying to, uh, it's you know urge to uh, you know produce the probables but because of the invasion pressure they couldn't able to you know, do it actually and uh, in my even uh, you know, the size where you have both species there so the uh, the snow trout you know, get mature much earlier in a small size class around 150 160 size itself no you will find a mature stage actually one real stage it is attaining but in normal uh, case without uh, the uh, invasions uh, invasive species so even more than 250 gram after that only slowly it get mature actually so again it is no uh, pressure on the you know their uh, biology of uh, invasive species on the native uh, species uh, similarly, uh, if you have uh, both populations same environment, the snow trout, no, it you know, uh, uh, it the growth rate is you no, know, it will slowly it will grow actually. It won't, but same time brown trout, no, it will reach like a J shape crop after reaching a particular size. Suddenly it will peak actually. That is the first graph it shows actually where you have both actually. But uh, the same uh, you compare with you know, snow trout growth with the where you do not have the brown trout. Again, just like a brown trout, the snow trout also no, grows steadily. Okay, so because of the pressure in the you know uh, the inversion pressure in the uh, thing, the growth also affecting. Not only breeding biology, growth also affecting in the uh, native environment. So this is a only one study we have done actually. Like there are so many species we have actually. That is a challenge actually. If we have clear water, we can understand, we can collect, and we can examine all those things. If it's a big river with you know uh, so much of uh, turbidity and we do not know what is happening in the system we can't able to see second one of the important new species uh, the uh, uh, operating catfish actually so it's a it's a, no doubt it's a predatory carnivore and it's we, we call as like you no know, broiler fish actually within a year you will get a one kg size how we are getting this one so whatever the the stuff Native species there keep on. No, it's like a voracious, you know, eater actually. And the Bharatpur, uh, a few years back, they had a huge problem. So uh, then, uh, since it is in a controlled system, so they can confine everything in the one particular place. Then they eradicated. Then they, they were observed. They checked the you no know, stomach content. They found a parakeets, morgan, turtles inside. Imagine what will happen to the you know small fishes actually. Uh, you may have, uh, have a huge number of uh, the catfish actually, but it can't you know, cater the entire you know, wildlife actually. So many of the you know, birds, you know, they can't you know, handle the, the you know, spined catfish actually. Some stock can manage. So it will also affect the other uh, thing actually. Uh, similarly, tilapia, so uh, the, the kind of damage which is causing in the environment, they are territorial actually. They create a you know, nest actually. So they hold, you know, like even uh, the below the water, they make a nest actually. They never allow the other species to come over there actually. So we have a lot of bobs, okay, Puntius, Pythias. They feed in the, you know, um, uh, the surface layer only. And the breeding as well as the spawning habitat we are losing actually. So they will disappear or, you know, this fellow is also, you know, aggressive, voracious uh, feeder actually. Similarly, sail fin that is also already Dr. Bijikumar, he mentioned, they make a lot of, you no know, holes not only the, the, the side of the bank and even the bottom also, they completely damage the entire environment. It's not suitable for feeding and um, uh, spawning in order of many species. And uh, this is the last slide. So coming to the, uh, the last slides, so there are a lot of points, you know, uh, still there are a lot of gray area actually. Okay. And uh, ecological impact of many other species still we do not know actually. Okay, so that is an important challenge actually. A second thing, uh, very hard to understand the behavior. How it is behaving in the environment actually. Then require more focus is on invasion biology. So one species we know, two species we know, we need to know, uh, come up with, you know, uh, the how it is, you know, uh, taking invasion, we need to see. And this is, uh, there is a potential chance for uh, transmitting the disease. Okay, so they may carry or they may act at your host suitable host for the many of the disease so that information we do not know genetic contamination also may happen because they are all external uh, you know, breeding animal actually so we also have catfish like clarias also we have but there you no know, is there any contamination anything happening so that kind of information 
we do not know so uh, what i expected during uh, this uh, deliberation first you know we can know uh, set up like a, uh, the monitoring uh, framework before that you know, we need to generate like a baseline data like kerala they have generated very nice you know baseline data where right now uh, the species are there so then only we can be able to know monitor actually like country level some lead institution take a lead and come up with a current status of distribution maybe through citizen science with the networking with the researcher that is the best thing first thing then we need to think of uh, thing. and uh, the third level we do not have any monitoring tool actually okay for uh, lantana there are some met methods to remove actually some species there are method actually but aquatic industries is how to you know manage if at all it getting into actually only capture but that is very very difficult actually genetically or some other mechanism some way if you can inter intervene like you know hybrid like you know making like a uh, sterile something you now we need to work actually then only we can manage the thing with this i conclude my talk thank you we have time for maybe one question any question very nice uh, work and very nice talk uh, dr johnson so uh, you showed us the uh, the growth uh, of uh, the native fish and in the presence of the brown trout and where it is not there are there uh, uh, experiments of transplanting animals in play from uh, co occurring uh, situations to without the invasive species situation to see if whatever you are showing actually comes if you put this animal in this condition will it uh, start to uh, show come back to the right. original so that's one of the uh, they have selected three uh, uh, area one is actually like a control area there is no uh, invasive mm. second one is uh, you have uh, invasion already established population with uh, the snow drop third one The periodical, you know, introduction is there actually. Okay. So they, 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 they are ankle salts all over to catch actually the stock also deplete and again, you know, uh, stocking, restocking is there actually. There are also same behavior they observe, like you know, where you have already established the proper problem. There is no much difference. Okay. So they have selected three set of uh, thing. One is like an introduction. You have native plus uh, periodically they stock. Fishery department they regularly they stock. No, I was thinking where it occurs with the crown trout. Mm. You take some individuals from there. You put it in a clean so that without uh, uh, transplantation. Yeah. Whatever the existing uh, they are observed. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you for the interesting talk. I request Dr. Mapathi to kindly felicitate Dr. Johnson. Our next talk of the day is by Dr. Karthikeyan Vasudevan from CCNB, and he will be talking about island ecosystems, vulnerability to invasive species, and the need for interventions. The case of Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Okay, so uh, so this talk is a deviation from what has happened in the uh, previous talks. I am not going to primarily restrict to aquatic ecosystems. There is a case of one aquatic invasive. but i'm going to talk about invasion in island systems and why is this important because islands are uh, important places for many endemics and islands are supposedly very simple systems and they operate by immigration emigration extinction and speciation that is how islands are formed and mainlands are a little more uh, uh, you can say immune they can lose they can get back very quickly islands if they lose they may not get back things very quickly so in some sense islands are more impacted by invasive species than any other ecosystem uh, globally and uh, i looked at a group of animals which are not often uh, looked at very carefully so i wrote this article in 2010 it came in century asia when i started the work in around that time and um, amazed by the beauty of the island in terms of the diversity and all that but slowly it kind of demystified a uh, young biologist joined my team uh, he is now dr s hari krishnan and he was uh, doing some uh, work on lizards and then he observed 
bullfrogs in uh, Andamans, which has not been reported before. And we reported it primarily because we could trace when it was introduced. So there is very often uh, a missing information on invasives on when the introduction took place. To understand what has been the trajectory since the introduction and you know where it was introduced. So you might uh, recollect that uh, there was a tsunami uh, earthquake in the uh, uh, Bay of Bengal close to Indonesia. Then it uh, hit, big waves hit uh, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, huge damage. And the majority of the damage was on the littoral ecosystem. If you understand islands, the littoral ecosystem is like the first frontier of any animal landing into the uh, island. The mountains are after that, a little bit raised. And fresh waters are very scant in islands. They are very scarce, very few small fresh water sources. So this frog was brought soon after the tsunami by a few uh, Bengali traders or maybe even along with fish which was brought as a package to rehabilitate people to gain livelihoods which they have lost. They have lost boats, they have lost houses, they have lost many things. So they were brought in big uh, containers and put into uh, you know a middle andaman in one of the villages and uh, this animal escaped and uh, it has gone native now it has spread all over the islands so it, we could trace is it, uh, i mean in the article we said like one person clearly gave us the idea of when this introduction happened because he belonged to that village he is born and brought up in that village so he knows what has happened so another important invasive uh, species, I'll come to the, uh, the frog story a little later. Uh, islands in, uh, of Andaman and Nicobar are rife with many invasive animals, invasive plants, invasive animals. And uh, it's a great uh, storehouse of, uh, uh, you know, uh, an ecosystem where you can do phenomenal studies on invasion. And uh, Cheetal, which is spotted here, was an invasive uh, herbivore brought into the island mainly for hunting. And the British released it into the island because I guess they were bored in the island doing nothing and maybe just putting prisoners into the island and uh, you know then they would go shooting these animals and uh, interestingly enough the natives the Jarawas in fact the Mahatma Gandhi National Park which is a, a marine national park of the country uh, has a very large population of uh, the spotted deer and sometimes when you go to the national park you can see a herd swimming in the sea from one island to the other and going to the next island to start to forage or whatever. So uh, the, the, and uh, we also see because there are many uh, people who come and live in these islands work in the plantations they do hunt and it is a protected species so they do invite a lot of uh, you know legal consequences uh, but what they say is this animal is almost breeding throughout the year they, every time when they hunt a female there is a it's already conceived it's having a baby inside so the, the, it's a, it means that there is no predation there is no pressure on the uh, food uh, requirement of the species, so it has proliferated. So this species occurs mostly in the in the uh, Andaman chain, uh, and Rutland is here. This is uh, Little Andaman. Rutland is a small island here. This island uh, has uh, the uh, Cheetal, and this was a focal area of our study. So this is where uh, we looked at uh, uh, the impact of uh, this invasive mammalian herbivore. And again, I had the opportunity to uh, meet uh, uh, now Dr. Nitya Prakash Mohanty, who took up this challenge and he, would, he started to look at what is the impact of this introduced mammal on reptiles, uh, lizards, because they eat the leaves which 
are food for the insects that the lizards need to eat and thereby reduce the lizard population or they eat up all the uh, ground flora so that uh, there is no nowhere for these animals to perch and uh, you know survive in that island ecosystem so there are two mechanisms that can uh, be impacting them so he did that work and we could visibly see the damage that these animals are doing to the native flora and this is the typical forest floor situation when uh, uh, you know very intense activity of uh, the uh, spotted deer would occur there is really no regeneration and as recent as 2023 uh, 2022 uh, september there is a study that has come up uh, from the ncbs which has documented long term impacts on vegetation due to the impact of these uh, animals. So uh, Nitya did all the hard work, and we had a uh, you know uh, an interesting finding to show that uh, two species of native uh, uh, gametes are impacted by the uh, spotted deer, primarily because of the alteration in the habitat. So Nitya uh, also became very uh, interested in this whole invasion biology. So he went on to do a key informant survey of three invasive species in the islands. One is the common mina, the, uh, the house sparrow and uh, the African giant snail. All of them were brought into the islands accidentally and released into the uh, uh, into these islands. So using the key informant surveys, it, he, we could map the distribution of these uh, species and the, uh, the real hotspots of their occurrence which can be helpful in determining how much uh, of this uh, species is uh, spreading and how it can be controlled. And it looks like the roads are very important for say uh, sparrows in this case and uh, uh, in the case sparrows mainly the ports and uh, roads miners because you can see miners uh, traversing even sitting on buses and stuff like that. So uh, among reptiles you have the the world famous invasive tree snake, the brown tree snake in Guam which has exterminated probably many species and uh, birds and uh, reptiles have vanished in this island because of this uh, invasive species. And uh, invasive mammals again uh, pigs, horses and uh, spotted deers like in Andamans have been responsible. In the case of amphibians, you have uh, this cane toad which was brought in for cultivation, for controlling pests of sugar cane into Australia uh, from South America and it has gone uh, amok in the entire island. And there are two uh, snippets of information that I thought would be very relevant to this audience that the Australian government says the biological control for uh, the, they they give an assessment of the benefit to cost ratios and they say the benefit to cost ratio is 20 to 1 for controlling invasives this is uh, the parliamentary uh, you know as the, the the government of australia the uh, the people who understand what is happening with the invasive invasive species have uh, been able to say this and then they also make an assessment of the cost which is uh, 95,000 uh, Australian US dollars per square kilometer to eradicate the species which is very high I and mean, if you relate it in terms of what we can do in, in our country it might run it might be very difficult. So in terms of scientific knowledge, I feel there is sufficient evidence to intervene that we need interventions very fast, very, uh, very quickly now. And for islands, certainly there should be uh, a lot more effort. And uh, this is my last slide. And uh, this is a document that was put forth, I think in 2016, if I'm right, right? And uh, a lot of discussions happened before that. And uh, this is the only document I see in the Government of India portal that talks about invasive species. And I contributed some information to the island ecosystems. And then I also noticed a very interesting way of prioritizing uh, con you know, actions to control invasive species. And here, already people have been talking about it in this audience. Uh, th 
they have lumped uh, several like freshwater oil and marine terrestrial i would like to uh, you know engage with you and understand is there a need to lump them like this priorities are important but to prioritize freshwater over may you know terrestrial or marine over terrestrial is not something that is very wise to do so i would like uh, you know a lot of interaction with you on the debate over productivity and resilience what do we want we want a resilient ecosystem or we want them to be just production ecosystems or both or where is the balance and then let's move on to processes the priorities how to set priorities this seems to be an example but maybe it can be revisited and ethics how are we going to deal with the ethical issues of removing animals okay so uh, these are my uh, thoughts off my head and uh, yeah thanks for listening are there any questions ரோடன்ஸ் as recent as i think in 2023 january they have gone and released ban owls in uh, lakshadweep islands from kerala uh, and it has uh, to control again rodents so biological control is a very uh, time test uh, i mean i don't know tested but yeah time yeah uh, very frequently sought after method but how good it is whether it has worked and what are the costs involved but there are some very good examples globally now available for example in galapagos they have removed goats so they had to shoot them uh, that is the only way to control them given the cost of doing anything other than shooting or killing them so they had to go in a chopper they had something you called a judas goat judas uh, as in the biblical judas would lead the entire herd because of the reproductive hormones and the entire herd will go through and they will fly on the chopper and shoot the animals thank you dr karthik for the interesting talk i request dr umapati to kindly felicitate dr karthik <laughs> Our next Our next talk of the day is by Mr Gopi Krishnan from CCMB and he will be talking about harnessing modern tools and methods for prevention and control of aquatic invasions Uh, good morning everyone i'll just give a short brief uh, account on the methods that are people have been using globally to control invasive species as well as a case study on the use of edna from our lab to start with uh, combating invasive species generally multi pronged uh, starting with the detection and early warning assessment of the uh, invasion bio monitoring prevention and control as well as involvement of citizens first thing detection and early warning the traditional methods for example if you want to detect a alien fish species the traditional method is always netting netting and catching but it has some uh, limitations um, for example it is highly time consuming and it is too costly and you need a very high human resource and also uh, we require trained taxonomists who are becoming rarer and rarer day by day um in addition to that we need different types of nets to catch different types of aquatic species like mussels and fishes and prawns <coughs> and different types of uh, nets so there is a alternative to combat these um, limitations one is the use of environmental dna um, which works um, with the underlying principle that organisms tend to shed dna in the ecosystem in the environment for example if the fish living in water they uh, shed cells and then these cells when they break up the dna of the cells will be uh, diffused in the water 
All we have to do is just filter, collect the water, filter it and then harvest the DNA which can be further processed uh, to detect the invasive species or any other endangered species. Um, in our lab we have been uh, started working on two uh, invasive species um, who were previously mentioned uh, other speakers. The African catfish Clarius garipanus and uh, Suckermouth catfish from South America which is Terigolictus. Um, to detect uh, any invasive species using uh, eDNA, we need a species specific QPCR assay and which is, uh, which is a very simple procedure where we have to design a primer that is specific only to the target species which will not bind and amplify any DNA of any other non-target species. You can clearly uh, see here that uh, the primer designed for Clarius garipanus binds only to the garipanus but it doesn't bind with Rusumeri or Batraca's uh, DNA because of the mismatches in this. Um, how does it work in real life? We have also done in vitro analysis uh, with the PCR of all the um, co-occurring species which are phylogenetically close related as well as other sympatric species and we found that this whatever the marker we have designed uh, amplifies only caripenis and doesn't amplify the DNA of any other species and we have also standardized the qPCR to put in simple words this is just like COVID testing how we use uh, specific primers for COVID like to detect COVID in the coronavirus in the sample we use a primers to detect the invasive species in the sample with this, we wanted to uh, map the distribution of this in a larger scale which is lacking. Currently, there is no large scale distribution map for any aquatic invasive species. And uh, to get a good geographical representation, uh, we put a grid of 100 square kilometer um, um, on either, I mean, one degree lat long. And uh, this is a good representation because it includes uh, sampling points across all the major river systems of Kaveri, Tungabhadra, uh, Godavari, Krishna and uh, Periyar. Um, all it requires is to just to filter as less as 1 litre water from multiple locations in per ecosystem and this is how the filter, filter, filter looks like after filtering the water and from this we can just isolate the DNA and we use this DNA to test the presence of the species with the assay that I mentioned before and uh, we have already sampled most of the places except 4-5 uh, uh, locations and we have analysed almost half of the samples so far predominantly in the western Ghats. Um, here you can see that the positive uh, out of the, all the locations that we analyzed so far except three the rest are all uh, showing positive detection and to corroborate this results we also did a survey uh, by talking to the local fishermen whether have they seen this fish before or visiting the local market adjacent to the dams and the results our positive results uh, correlate very well with the uh, positive as well as negative results correlate very well with the uh, survey that we did the interesting point here that i wanted to mention is two places Shanti Sagara and Vanilla Sagara where we were not able to do the survey with the fishermen. We could not find any fishermen to talk to or but even those uh, locations showed positive detection highlighting that eDNA can be a standalone technique without the use of any complementing survey. Uh, similarly, uh, my uh, our lab mate Neil Deep Ganguly has been working on uh, developing an assay for uh, Terigolithus species, Sakramoth catfish. The one big issue with this species is uh, there are multiple Terigolithus species uh, which has invaded India and they undergo extensive hybridization which makes uh, it detecting the species uh, almost I mean, um, distinguishing the species using morphological traits almost impossible. So um, he came up with an interesting idea that instead of designing a species specific primer, we will design a genus specific primer targeting all the three invasive pterygolithus species. And you can see that uh, the primer that he designed amplifies all the pterygolithus species, three species, but he doesn't amplify any, none of the other non-target species. And he predominantly worked in the Eastern Ghats and then uh, the results show that uh, out of the sampling locations, uh, more than two-third of the uh, locations showed positive signal for Terigolithus species. This includes uh, places like Kolyaru, Pulikat and Chilika which are known for high uh, diversity, uh, fish diversity as well as uh, high endemism. Also they are important for fisheries resources. The one uh, beautiful beautiful thing about eDNA is that um, apart from the limitation that I explained with uh, the traditional methods, we do not have those limitations with eDNA. Uh, we do not need much manpower, just one or two trained person has to uh, do this and not much money is required. And uh, more importantly, uh, it requires only very minimal capacity building. Any university or a local college or in, uh, institute where you can just install a QPCR machine and then train few individuals that is sufficient to uh, start local scale uh, biodiversity monitoring. Next when it comes to assessment of invasion biomonitoring, there have been tradi many traditional methods. 
uh, recently people have come up with some modern tools for example this is a very uh, recently published paper uh, using remote sensing to see the extent of invasion over the period of 5 years in nigeria by uh, invasive invasive naipa species against the mangrove and uh, another cool technique is DNA metabarcoding, like how I mentioned in the QPCR method where we detect one single species or uh, three species together in a genus specific primer. This allows us to detect almost all the species present uh, in the aquatic ecosystem because they use a universal marker for doing a PCR and then the reads of all the DNA uh, is sequenced and then with the reference data set we can match and then find out what all the species were there starting from virus to the humans. And uh, another uh, thing is acoustic monitoring. People have started uh, using this extensively nowadays. It is very similar to the DNA metabarcoding, but the only difference is instead of collecting DNA data, we are collecting acoustic data. And then similarly, how we use a reference data set of DNA gene data set, like Bold database for the DNA metabarcoding, here we use a reference data set of acoustic uh, calls, like manually annotated acoustic calls of known species. And then after that, once we deploy this acoustic uh, tools in the wild, you, the help of AI and machine learning nowadays, you just like do real time monitoring without the intervention of any manual annotation. This is one more interesting thing where um, there are situations where you cannot bring the sample back to the lab and uh, there is not much time required to uh, bring the sample back and analyze take two or three days. For example, if the consignments are moving from one country to another country, you may have to act fast and then detect whether the species is present or not. This is called a uh, loop mediated PC, uh, amplification PCR which is called LAMP PCR or uh, also called as isothermal PCR. You don't need to have a PCR thermal cycler. You just need one uh, single temperature dry bath and uh, this kit will uh, help you to identify whether species present or not. The, when you um, add the sample, the color will change from pink to yellow. If the species present, you see the uh, presence of the species, I mean um, change in color. Let's say color, color change is not there, then you can declare that the species, species is not present. Um, people have been doing uh, control of invasive species through biological with the physical extermination or using chemical methods also. Uh, I just wanted to highlight two new techniques. One is using pheromone traps. You can see that uh, keeping two different pheromones in uh, two water channels and then you can see the movement of fish exactly towards the respective pheromones. One advantage of this is uh, instead of uh, when, when you compare to the physical trapping, you may also run into a risk of catching the native species which is not your target. But here you lure them the specific invasive species which you want to exterminate. Second thing is uh, gene drive inheritance. Here um, you genetically modify an animal which is a mutant and you introduce into the wild but uh, rather than following a Mendelian inheritance of 50-50 uh, inheritance, here the mutant uh, individual has an advantage of a, of a skewed ratio of inheritance. For example, if this mutant, uh, the, the engineered gene codes for uh, making the fish male, then over successive generations you will see only males and there are no females. But again, these two techniques are still remaining as a proof of concepts. Uh, before deploying it into the wild, it requires a lot of environmental impact assessment. Finally, citizen science. We all know the success story of the e-bird being one of the biggest contributor for uh, data for uh, studying birds. Similarly, we have iNaturalist. But uh, this is for all the species iNaturalist. Apart from that, uh, US, uh, Canada and other countries have come up with some other um, apps like Outsmart and other apps which actually helps the citizens to engage. For example, they create awareness to, um, to not to encourage the uh, hikers who go on mountain hiking in either bikes. So they can identify any invasive uh, new species and then like they can report it in this portal. So this is also like a uh, will form a if in India, if something is brought like this and if we can deploy it to the citizens and create awareness, we will get a lot of data. So with this, I would like to conclude with just a word of caution that even though all these tools and techniques look so cool, ultimately effective use of this relies on first understanding the fundamental processes and patterns associated with the alchemation of the species as well as why a system is resilient to invasion or not. Only then we can choose what tool is best to use. And that is how we can achieve value control. And thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, this I think I just missed uh, your uh, thing. You told uh, you are filtering one liter of water.
so you are getting what exactly mm. that material what you are getting from that so uh, it is called a mixed cellulose ester membrane okay so when you pass water through it only the water comes out mm. all the dna and other substances get adhered to the filter membrane uh, dna substance of what i mean this uh, i mean feed or algal bloom or fish one no? all all aquatic species okay. so generally starting from bacteria viruses to humans whoever okay. step into when okay. we shed cells okay the cells break and then dna gets to diffuse so okay. it is like a soup of dna of all the organisms in the ecosystem Okay, okay. So you have the control of this galliponus, and you are comparing in that. Yes. So then so you are. So the marker that we have designed actually goes and binds only to the DNA of the galliponus. It okay. won't bind to any other bacteria or virus or any other fish species. Okay. So according to you, like uh, South Indians, almost all reservoirs, this fish already is there. Yes, we have even collected samples. No, along with um, collecting samples, we even surveyed with the fishermen, okay. and we have even taken pictures of those. And almost everywhere, it is very few scatter, like three or four. For example, Madurai Dam Lake in Chennai, which is a landlocked lake. Yeah. Only there we could not find. So it is like very few places we could not find. Yeah. So further thing, like uh, we can quantify. I mean, any methodology. Yes, but that is a tricky thing. Quantifying the abundance of a species uh, with DNA is a tricky thing. You can relatively quantify okay. relative to the abundance of tilapia. What is the uh, abundance of garipanas? We can say. Okay. But exactly how many individuals of garipanas is present? That is little bit tricky. That requires lot of mesocosm experiments and lot of standardizations, which is still at the initial stages globally also. Okay. So then I should not stop there, no. So then what is yes, the further yes, process? Yes. How to I mean take it out? Um, take it out in the sense. Mean, okay. How to remove those things, no? Uh, that is like we yeah. have to sit and discuss. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is a holy grail of yeah. innovation biology. <laughs> yeah, relative abundance you can say with which lack is high, which lack is low, which part is low, which lack high. That can be actually mentioned in uh, among the ten lacks like that. One of the cities in Hyderabad said the two lacks are very high abundance. Yeah. So you can have is higher or lower. We can't say exactly how much higher. No, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Suppose if we say. The particular quantity is there. Yeah. Most we say like zero, no. We don't yeah, want yeah, anything. The yeah. species in the open water. Yeah. Okay. Because, because it's, uh, I mean, it will take care of all species. Yeah. And also, right. you can we can also give priorities so yeah. that this lack has a high uh, I think abundance. It's a high time, so we have to think the other one that's also. So to add to the question that you asked, like how to eradicate them, generally bioaccumulation is a, uh, not a single factor. Really, it is a combination of multiple factors. So we need to understand the what are the factors behind invasion of particular species. That the combination of keeps. Of Yes, that actually we have been doing. Uh, the actual source comes from Congo. It has came from Congo uh, 40 years back. But currently within India, it's already in now, India. It's already in India. Yes. One decade or something like yes. that. Yes. <coughs> suppose due to flood hmm. or I mean adjacent to that survey, somebody is culturing. Yes. These are some of the things. So with the field survey, what we done? These are all the possible um, because uh, even uh, spillover from agriculture farms. Uh, Dr. Rajiv will uh, explain more. Uh, spillover from agriculture farms in Kerala was one of the major reason for them. And um, we see two patterns. One is like they are also naturally dispersing, as well as people are actively dispersing. So both are happening. So if we can share this, uh, is that you publish anything? Yeah, so we have developed the assay that we have published. The remaining distribution and then the population so genetics work we are under. Like yes. So yes. 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 So we can uh, collaborate something. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Next step. Yes. So we have to sure. Meet up there. Sure. If you can uh, next week or something, you can meet. Yeah, we'll make sure. a report separate yeah. for these two species. Along with other report also. Yeah. Same. So we can make some advisory for the other states. Hmm. At least wherever you uh, confirm those states. At least they can take. Uh, I mean, total uh, survey of the yes. different uh, reservoirs and also. The fishermen they can have separate meeting. You yes. You meet few people. Yes. Then yes. Then if you go to the state government, they can have like a cluster based. Uh, approach to investigate the data mm -hmm. this uh, menace is very serious mm -hmm. then state governments with central government support they can take them seriously and mm -hmm. yes okay sure we will share you. those thank you for the nice information thank you thank you thank you Kupi, for the interesting talk our next talk of the day is by dr ac anil from nio and he'll be talking about marine bio invasions forward reverse point middle one now uh, well, i am going to speak something different in the context that i have heard lot about uh, aquatic invasion terrestrial situations of invading organisms 
here is something which you all know whether we have had an invasion or uh, what has actually happened because you, you, when you go on to a sea, co sea coast or uh, seashore unless you see an organism you won't know there is something changing and if it ha be, ha happens to happen inside the water body you can even forget about it so uh, but I'm uh, glad to say that I come from a success story background uh, I spent 25 years doing uh, research in marine bioinvasion as a beginner and uh, it is uh, moved to a direction where a global effort led to a convention that could control bioinvasion, marine bioinvasion. So uh, I would restrict my talk to marine bioinvasion mediated through ships because there are many other uh, invasive routes but I am not touching upon them but I would uh, uh, restrict my talk to marine bioinvasion mediated through ships because it is one of the success stories which is even recognized globally as one of the championing global environment facility programs that was ever executed by Jeff UNDP. So my association with this uh, is very interesting and uh, due to lack of time and uh, space I would restrict my talk to efforts in the region, uh, vector identification which is an important tool, uh, all this was done quite early because uh, there are many vectors but I restrict my talk to ship mediated by marine bioinvasion and uh, how did it this actually come into context and what actually led a global action plan that is uh, invertebrate invasions perspective and how the global community thought that you should go about controlling this rather than only talking about invasions and what are the pressures that are coming up fresh and how it will change in the years to come and what are my few suggestions for uh, marine bioinvasion perspective but there could be lessons for aquatic invasions and terrestrial invasions. So there is a need to think large scale. I have been speaking Dr. Karthik and Dr. Umapati that uh, that if you think of, as uh, the Secretary of Water Resources was saying, that if you are thinking of project mode implementation of a specific action plan, it won't take anywhere. But here is an example from global community and uh, the champion discourse and India fortunately uh, gave me an opportunity to be part of this story. It all started in 1990s in the Rio conference where bioinnovation was considered one of the major threats to global health. And in that uh, conference, Global Environment Facility allocated a huge amount of money to control marine bioinvasion. And that program led to adoption of a marine ballast water management program, ships ballast water management program by the International Maritime Organization. And India happened to be part of this one of those diplomatic conferences. And uh, they chose Mumbai as one of the pilots countries, uh, a country pilot program and India was given the opportunity to lead the program for South Asia region. And I happened to be in my younger 40s and uh, I was given an opportunity by the director and uh, it, I was telling uh, Dr. Karthik yesterday that it came to me after a round table uh, voyage in the institute and I, I took it up as a challenge but it led me to a great learning process and I am here to share that. Now why did this all come up? You can see a, a tiny looking mitilopsis ally, a muscle, which uh, my, my mentor, senior mentors actually reported from the ports of Vishakhapatnam and uh, Mumbai. People caught hold of that because this is a non-invasive species, a cousin of this species is has devastated Great Lakes and threatened Australia and many other places. So the global community thought any ship that goes out of India needs to be quarantined for the presence of this species. So ships going to Australia were held up for six to seven hours outside the port unless they proved that they had done sufficient measures to control their pr presence in their ship, they will not be allowed to berth. So that made the international community choose this is an ideal site in the tropics to bring out actually the initial phase was only uh, building up awareness 
So in fact, uh, the, uh, the secretary at that point in time, Dr. Mr. D. D. T. Joseph, asked the International Maritime Organization person, okay, how does India benefit from this? We have this organism already. How does it matter? Now it is, and then he said, see, it can spread across the inland riverine system. It does. It can cause devastating effect at Great Lakes and things like that. So uh, hesitantly, he gave us, go ahead, Anil, if you are so interested to carry on this, take it forward. So these are some of the pictures that actually uh, happened in the early 2000s. And uh, in the Indian Ministry of Shipping also got involved. And we wanted to develop a full end-to-end -end program rather than only addressing the scientific issues. Only, which is very important, which served as a backbone. So the first exercise that we carried out was to raise awareness that we are addressing ship mediated by invasion only partly if we address ballast water which is the major contributor for example uh, for the people who are not aware of ballast water i can tell you in brief that ballast water is something which is an essential requirement for shipping that in the absence of cargo the hull and the propeller has to be submerged so in order to do that they take tons and tons of seawater so that ship can sail smoothly so the weather conditions don't disturb the ship's stability. But along with this organ, uh, taking of ballast water into the ships, they carry lots of organisms, millions of organisms in the sea water from, uh, let's say from Japan to Goa or uh, America to uh, Saudi Arabia because oil tankers go empty when they ca carry no cargo. So that was, that was designated as one of the major vectors for transporting organisms. Let me come to the debate whether that is the only vector, that are some other vectors associated. But in the process of that mission, I was a great champion uh, leading to telling that this is one of the vectors we need to address, another important vector, which is the organism that go on the hulls of the vessel. <coughs> now, why hulls of the vessel? Uh, because... Uh, that is a greater area for uh, free attachment of organism. They can, one individual organism can go to an alien environment and release thousands of larvae. And the chances of the larvae going inside uh, the ballast water tank and surviving in that dark condition is rather limited. I won't say no, but it is case specific. So, as a part of the initiative that what Global Ballast Water Management Program gave us in Bombay, I had the fortune of convincing the cabinet minister to take this forward to all the major ports of India and we had several components of doing this. At any given point in time at that uh, situation we had about 100 people working in, the, in, in this program. So it led to several uh, motivations and we carried out uh, in inventorization of the port biological biota. We established a database for the situation of the organisms in place at that point in time in history which will serve as a basis for recording if there is anything new that is happening. We knew that we are talking in uh, gargons if you only do it for India because we are surrounded by waters which come from many other countries. So Ministry of External Affairs helped me to promulgate a multilateral program. In fact, India funded that program and we were happy to be associated with nine ASEAN countries and we carried out uh, an assessment of biofouling simultaneously in all these nine countries to temp uh, awa raise awareness and bring up action plans that can help address bioinvasion from a regional perspective. And that has led us to thinking that bioinvasion as a single vector through ballast water should not be thought of because we have, and one, one more interesting point is that India had the opportunity to become uh, the chair of the convention which actually brought in guidelines to control discharge of ballast water in Indian ports. And the outcome of that was that we could uh, help the ports of the India in, in India to develop decision support system. Uh, to the lack of time, I am not going into the details of that, but we can say that not all of the organisms come through ship's ballast water. We also need to know that the ship's hull also is an actual vector which can actually introduce organism. So when you are developing ports, you are actually 
creating habitats for organisms to hop from one place to another. So that that was that was the indication that I was saying. But if you look at an overstick, but one, give me a minute, please. Uh, so I will say that if you look at this invasive invertebrate species bioregion perspective from a marine bioinvasion point of view, the dot sizes in India are very small. Does it say that uh, we are uh, free of bioinvasion? I would say no. We don't know much about it. Okay, so uh, at least because the first statement that I made, we don't know what is actually happening in the oceans. But our studies carried out during this program has said that some of it, as, he, as Karthik was saying, was already there, we were not noticing it. So we carried out in-depth sediment studies, to core studies to see whether they were already there. And we have found proofs to say that they were there. And it's only happening to be seen nowadays in the recent past because of vigorous observations. So we, because of that, I would say observations make an important component of bioinvasion studies. As I was telling uh, Dr. Arun yesterday, Malaska happens to be the champion of bioinvaders and I have, uh, for the benefit of the readers who have, won't have the time to do this, you may please go through this, that paper published in uh, Asian Journal of Science and Technology, a product that came out of the initiative in the Ministry of External Affairs had for uh, the South Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, a book was uh, produced and we have an action plan in place for that and we demonstrated the need for a global action plan and collaboration with the neighboring countries. So several reports have come out but this is the master of all which is the uh, ballast water decision support system for the major ports of India. Now today any ship that comes to India is governed by the international guidelines they can discharge only, I can say, swimming pool standard waters. Their hulls have to be clean. These are all not very savvy, are not very palatable to the ship owner. But they have been forced to into uh, accomplishing this because of the threats this invasive organism posed to the environment. I see that. So if there is a wish, if you want to develop an end-to-end -end program, think large, bring industries into the fold and see how best you can. The cost should not be the question. If you are limited by the cost, you are finished. Now, the global ballast water management program and the globe hauling program, global in nature, were constructed on an end-to-end -end basis and has seen to it that it is helpful to see how marine bioinvasion can be done. I would not get into the details of this, but if you don't understand marine bioinvasion, if you don't address bioinvasion ecology point of view, you will have long ramification included with climate change. You can see here our fisheries pattern is changing. It is absolutely because of the food web dynamics is changing. I'm not getting into the details due to the lack of time, but we have done exclusive studies on why this fishery pattern is changing, why it is spreading and how it is to be visualized, how it is to be monitored for better fishery management. That's the next goal that is there in my mind for this country to take place. These are few suggestions which we can take during our discussions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Questions are there, but I <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you, Dr. Anil, for the in interesting talk. I request Dr. Karthike and Vasudevan to kindly felicitate our speaker. Our next talk of the day is by Dr. Arvin from ATRI and he will be talking on non-native freshwater mollusks of India. Thank you, Mahapati, for giving me this opportunity and thanks to Karthik Vasudevan also. <coughs> so, I will be talking about non-native freshwater mollusks of India. I think I am an odd man out, as Biju uh, told me in the morning. So, uh, due to lack of time, um, I might skip many slides. Maybe if you are interested, I can talk to you later. So, uh, freshwater molars are very important because they are helping nutrient uh, recycling in the freshwater environment. They are good source for uh, animals because they are uh, very high concentration of calcium. They are good uh, source of uh, food for humans, especially improvised 
uh, communities, especially in the northeast India and the coastal areas, and they are used for handicraft, research, and medicine. However, they also have got disservices, like they are pests to agricultural and horticultural crop, they are uh, invasive species, and they carry uh, disease for humans, and they are associated with many economic uh, lo lo losses uh, to humans. So, uh, we did small uh, literature survey to look at how many uh, non-marine mollusks uh, uh, are there in uh, relation to marine uh, uh, in the global database like you know, GISD and CABI. If you look at it, fresh, there are 10 uh, uh, freshwater mollusks have been listed in GISD, that is global invasive species database and only 5 which is not actually true, which is not updated uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, regularly. According to CABI, there are 12 marine uh, invasive species. This is yesterday I got this information. Uh, probably there may be many more. Uh, Anil sir can, can uh, throw some light on this. And there are th 13 freshwater and 15 t uh, terrestrial. So, what are the major pathways of introduction of this, uh, um, uh, especially the freshwater uh, invasive or uh, non native species? Major is the uh, pet trade. This is what uh, Professor Biju also told in the morning. The same case holds good for fishers and for uh, um, fresh, uh, freshwater mammals. And uh, the other uh, major uh, in introduction part is either accidental or unintentional and followed by food. So we did this um, mapping of uh, um, uh, uh, the non-native mollas in India, where did they come from, which are the origin um, of biogeographic region. Interestingly, you can make out many of these species uh, come from either Paleartic or ne Neotropic and very few from Indo-Malayan or ne Neotic uh, region. This is uh, paper is under review in biological invasions. So, in coming very specific to freshwater uh, uh, invasive species in India, there are five species which are found in the natural environment not right now as per the uh, data available, as per our uh, uh, data compiled in the last few years. These are the predominantly Physella, Pomacia, Amerena, Planobella and Planoperis. Uh, out of these five, this is the only one which is really big, the rest are all very sm small ones. So the controlling of these become even more challenging. The big one, big fishes are difficult to control uh, in the aquatic environment. Imagine the small mollusk uh, hiding inside the uh, Iconia or the Salvinia or Pistia plants and uh, any other aquatic matter in orbits, it's even more challenging uh, to c control these very uh, small um, uh, uh, invasive mammal sp species. We also did the mapping of uh, these non-marine mollusks, including uh, the terrestrial here into the different bi uh, biogeographic zones of India. As you can make out, um, this region, the Deccan, uh, we are part of, there are two uh, for freshwater uh, invasive species have been reported. One is Pamisia, the other one is uh, Faisala, uh, Faisa Acuta. Faisala is a new name. And many uh, biogeographic zones had uh, this uh, Faisala uh, predominantly present. So this is the next major invader in the aquatic system which has been neglected totally and nobody has ever bothered to report this or bother to uh, understand this, this small little snail, how it affects the uh, uh, native eco ecosystem. And this uh, freshwater mollusks also have an impact on, in, in especially invaded ones, have got impact on the uh, human health, like the carrier for cystosomiasis, uh, especially limnids and uh, uh, the pomacia, that's apple snails. And basically coming to the pomacia species, uh, they, they alter the macro, uh, uh, in the community structure in the wetland. They started breeding in, uh, in the large numbers in the natural system in India, and they, dis dis they cause the destruction of eggs of native mollusks and the destruction uh, to the native patties. Because you know, Indian farmers are you know small scale farmers. Majority of the Indian farmers holds less than uh, 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 four, uh, four acres of land. And any destruction, even 10, 20, 30 percent destruction to this paddy field will have greater economic loss to the farmer compared to the large uh, uh, or the bigger uh, farmers. And this is the uh, photograph from uh, Javed et al. in 2020. They reported large scale breeding of uh, this Pomacia diffuser, um, uh, Pomacia brigade C uh, in M Mumbai. And also we have seen 
breeding of the same species in Mulan Muta River in, in, uh, in Pune. They completely, re these species completely replaced native apple snails from uh, the Mulan Muta River. In 1960s, uh, native uh, apple snails were very uh, 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 dominant. Now, you hardly see any native uh, apple snails uh, in the Mulan Muta River and you can see uh, these species with a lot of egg mass uh, well within the Pune uh, city uh, limit. Yeah, the another recently uh, uh, in, uh, introduced or invaded species is the Pronorbella trivialis and it can uh, adapt to the wide range of uh, temperature that makes it even more advantage for this species to uh, uh, spread uh, especially in the tropical regions and they grow, uh, grow faster uh, and attain maturity within a few days and native predators do not feed on this species. There are experiments by uh, uh, Gautam Aditya and others from uh, uh, Calcutta University under the control setup, they showed that native predators do not feed on this exotic molar species, but they prefer the native species. So we had to come up with some other mechanism to con uh, control this species in native habit. And also this is a very small, tiny uh, snail, this bit. And this species also uh, carries a cystosomes which call, uh, causes uh, swimmer's itch. It's not a major uh, disease, but you know, you don't feel any uncomfortable feeling in your body, right? When you go for a swimming, you're going for a swimming for a pleasure, right? And you come back with the itching skin, nobody wants that, that right? And these species uh, spread those kind of cystosomes in, 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 the, in, in the water. So, you know, in many, uh, uh, you know, the rural community, kids, they play in the water. It's mostly polluted water and these species are predominant. And you know, any kind of discomfort, it's, we don't like, right? Yeah. And yeah, this is how the cystosomes is transmitted uh, from water to, uh, uh, from snail, uh, to either, either to the birds or to the human beings, either by consumption of food or if there is any uh, uh, cut in the skin or damage or wound, they'll get into the human body and it causes rashes, light fever and other things. Not a major thing, but still uncomfortable uh, feeling. Well, I'm not going to this. And come to very specifically to India, there are not much uh, st studies on their impact on biodiversity economy and human health. And uh, But Faisal Akito was reported to feed on native uh, uh, in, uh, aquatic plants. And uh, recently we did the uh, global level uh, niche modeling study to understand the the climate suitability of these 30 and odd uh, invasive species at the global level, very pretty looking mammals, but they are nasty. So, and we showed that for many species, uh, they shift their ranges. You know, green is the native niche in the native habitat, red is the niche in the introduced habitat, and as you can see here, either they are expanding its niche into newer climatic range or completely shifting into the novel climatic condition that means they are shifting they are finding a new home uh, away from their native home this is the concept we pro proposed la last year either home away from home or new home away from the home many species uh, uh, adapt to the newer novel climatic condition and make their home in that introduced uh, ranges uh, so what uh, what needs to be done probably we can discuss in detail in the afternoon well, uh, we should study on the loss uh, to the agriculture, damage to aquatic plants, <coughs> spread of diseases, competition with the local species, that is very, very important, impact to native flora and fauna. And also, if you look at the Indian literature on freshwater mollusk invasion ecology, hardly any papers uh, on freshwater mollusk invasion ecology. Uh, we, this is based on 3000 and odd literature starting from 1830 till 2023. We compiled more than 3,000 uh, uh, literature on non-marine molars and we classified and this is the state where we are. So uh, these molars are in the pet trade. This is these are available in Bangalore, uh, Kukochi, Madras and Calcutta, aquarium traders and these are the new source of invasive species uh, uh, in India. We should keep an eye on this and uh, we should uh, maybe we can discuss how to tackle this issue it's now within the aquarium trade and it shouldn't get into the uh, uh, native waters uh, we did the dna uh, dna barcoding for of this which will be released very soon so that it can be used 
for the uh, rapid identification of the species in the water. And specifically, you should keep in mind uh, this species is called assassin snail, belonging to the family Nasaridae, and it's a carnivorous snail introduced into the aquarium to control other snails in the aquarium. But if it gets into the native habitat, it can feed on other species. It has been shown in the laboratory setup. And how to control? We can hand pick, kill, bait, molecular and make use of it. Like this lantana we have. At A3, we have used lantana to make a beautiful elephant. You can see swanky new airport terminal in Bangalore, the huge lantana stand, uh, elephant standing, or in Cambridge, this one. So similar kind of things we can think of using invasive species so that you can control uh, on one side, other side, you can increase the livelihood of the people, so the, the poor people, and at the same time, you can control this uh, uh, species. Okay, I will skip this. And citizen science project, some, uh, Gopi was telling there is no uh, citizen science portal in India. It is not true. This is, we have developed a tree. It's called a spice. So, a spotting gale in invasive species. We, there are only 10 or 12 species, but we can always up, uh, update the list. And it's available open access. It's not there for the last six years. So, unfortunately, many people don't know about it. It's our problem because we have not advertised it. And we can include more species here. To, uh, and make uh, this is available in the India Biodiversity Portal. We started this and also have started this called a SMIS Mapping in a Station Club. We can also uh, put the data into this, which will talk to the uh, SPICE portal as well. So we are not recording, not knowing, not listing. So there are a lot of molluscan extinction, not only because of the anthropogenic disturbance, but also invasive uh, alien uh, species. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Arvind, for the interesting talk. I request Dr. Umapati to kindly uh, felicitate our speaker. Uh, so one minute, Lord Nike. Uh, our next speaker of the day is Dr. Vidyadhar Ratkore from Sakon and he will be speaking about assessing the carbon sequestration of alien invasive species, macrophyte and fishes from select wetlands of Tamil Nadu. Thank you. Ah, it's okay. uh, very good afternoon everyone and first of all I would like to uh, you know, so thanks to Dr. Umapati, Dr. Karthik for arranging this uh, very interesting seminar where we get to discuss and present our uh, ideas and interest, especially focusing on alien invasive species that most of the speaker in the morning have told us about why there are no empirical studies and the problem of invasion is seamless to be uncontrolled. So what I'm going to talk to you about is an idea that we're just exploring uh, trying to understand and estimate the carbon storage that is available in the wetlands. Focusing on two key components of wetlands, macrophytes and fish. We don't have enough data to present but this is just an idea I thought of uh, you know, uh, sharing with you all. So we all know wetlands are the major sink uh, for the carbon. They are storing carbon for many many or more than thousand of years. Uh, they provide numerous ecosystem services as Dr. Um, Arvind has talked about including nutrient cycling, water for drinking, recreations and you know the carbon basically carbon pool is stored in different varieties of uh, living matters, vegetation including uh, leaf litters, sediments, peat soil, organic soils for many many years like thousands of years and uh, <coughs> the you know oxygen poor most of the wetlands which is inundated due to the water so there's a, a less oxygen that is available and the oxygen is being trapped by the plants by you know fixing the carbon dioxide so the rate of decomposition is very very low and over the period of time the organic matter accumulates and that is basically the sink that we are calling wetland as a sink and uh, how carbon pool is being accumulated in the different components of uh, wetlands or the different corners of the wetland is uh, it varies based on their size shapes and different components of course but empirically speaking there are hardly any studies and there are very notable studies that are being coming up in the uh, in india especially from west bengal 
So with this, we thought of in exploring this idea of quantifying the carbon sequestration of two components, and this is just an you know exploratory uh, thought that we wanted to take it forward, uh, trying to understand the influence of anthropogenic environmental variables on the distribution of uh, you know the wetland component that is macrophytes and fish, and then of course try and relate with how livelihood is intricately important uh, because you know we culture many fishes, <coughs> including tilapia and uh, catfishes how the dependency is also affected by you know uh, these components what we did a brief visit to the many uh, wetlands in the now they are lakes in Coimbatore city i called it as a peri urban and urban because they are mostly man made and with just to pilot study what we did was we visited these wetlands and try and estimate the amount of, I mean, certain key variables of the water chemistry just to understand how wetlands are polluted or what the water chemistry is like. So there are eight wetlands we, that we visited recently with the, um, uh, yeah, so this was the ferry done recently. We use multi-parameter water kit, uh, basically to understand how variables are distributed. And we identified, we haven't done any scientific uh, like collection of uh, macrophytes and fish, but we interacted with the local fishermen just to understand how much is the infestation uh, of these wetlands. So this is how in size of these wetlands, less than a, you know one acre, most of the Achinkulam and uh, Sindhinalur wetlands are very big and uh, there are very <coughs> tiny wetlands such as Perur and Vedapatti. How did we find uh, what was the water chemistry like? You know, water chemist, water temperature was fairly within the range uh, of threshold that is a permissible threshold that we have. But interestingly, the total dissolved solids and electrical conductivity, which was fairly uh, large, uh, that I will show you here. And the range that you can see in the basically this coming from the sewage and you know industrial pollutions that are feeding into these wetlands. Uh, this is what I want to draw your attention to the Krishnam Patti Lake electrical conductivity and uh, you know it was way higher in many of the lakes which are man-made because of the industrial and local uh, sewage that is coming into these lakes uh, similarly the total dissolved solid is another nutrient uh, you know um, parameter in terms of the threshold value of salinity it is less than 0.5 but most of the lakes are uh, you know high showing a high salinity largely because of the contribution coming from the sewage and uh, areas like that and this is how the same in a graphical manner that I wanted to show you. Uh, these lakes were divided into peri-urban and urban. Peri-urban are the areas where the lay wetlands are distributed just adjacent to the uh, paddy fields and agriculture uh, croplands, whereas the urban is mostly man-made where the industries and you know domestic sewage constantly get uh, inundated or uh, uh, flowed into. What we found was the macro invertebrates, I mean sorry, macrophytes, there was water hyacinth, was uh, infested in most of the lakes and uh, this particular fish tilapia is also infested heavily in bigger lakes like Singhanalur and uh, you know and many local fishermen were thriving on this they were tender given and then people used to constantly commercially uh, you know uh, <coughs> taking out the fish and selling it to the market but when we went and discuss about any studies or any uh, conservation efforts or you know the, now this is these are lakes some of them lakes some of these lakes are being considered for the uh, smart city initiatives as a lake restoration sites but there are hardly any studies or uh, you know interventions done by the government or any uh, local organizations including Sakon Sakon has been doing some work on birds but not on these components so as I was uh, discussing with you that water sites and tilapia were infested in most of the lakes that we've encountered many a times by interacting with the fishermen and uh, you know but when you look at or is try and estimate the carbon sequestration present in these components the some lakes are you know, we found draining regularly meaning this will also impact the estimation of carbon that is present in these two components so this needs to be taken forward to understand how it you know the distribute how the carbon sequestration or carbon pools uh, can be studied in different components so we are hoping to start a new and systematic studies uh, some of these lakes including some of the hill uh, hill uh, streams and hill lakes so this is the way forward that i have uh, think i should uh, you know stop here and definitely certain ideas we would like to discuss during the post lunch hour and i would uh, you know uh, happy to answer any questions that you may have on this point thank you very much
any questions okay we uh, yeah so i'll yeah i'll just request dr uh, umapati to kindly felicitate doc dr vidyadhar we shall for we shall not break in for lunch and we will have we will assemble here in auditorium at 230 